You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org and RudolfSteinerPress.com, the latter one in London, which are the two uh, houses that provide us with English translations of Steiner. Please, if you can, patronize their websites and their books. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies Science, Philosophy, Theology, Education, Social Science, Theory of Language. Seven lectures given during the Anthroposophic College course in Berlin, March 6 to the 11, 1922. Translated by Judith Vermuth Atkinson. And it is Collected Works, Volume 81. This is Lecture 1 on Anthroposophy and Natural Science, given in Berlin on March 6th, 1922. Most Honored Participants The Committee for this academic week has requested that each day I give an introduction to the topic that will be discussed later from a scholarly perspective during the course of the same day. This decision was based on the view, perhaps, that the various branches of science and of life could be enriched by the perspective of anthroposophy. In that sense, I would like to ask you to take these first lectures of mine only as introductory comments to the discussions of each particular day. With regard to the perception of anthroposophic research methods, it has always been most astonishing to me to realize the resistance demonstrated toward anthroposophy, especially on the part of philosophy and natural science, although I am not saying only on the part of natural science. The reason for that resistance is apparently the belief that in some implausible, confrontational way, anthroposophy contradicts the methods of natural science, which have been established as extremely productive in the course of the last few centuries particularly during the 19th century. This belief seems to me one of the things concerning anthroposophy that is most difficult to understand in our times. It is precisely those productive methods of research established in natural science that anthroposophy wants to develop further. However, if we want to understand anthroposophy, we should be able to assume that in the idea of, quote, further development, close quote, there is something more than what today people usually call further development of theoretical views. Development of theoretical views means to most contemporary people that this specific way of analogical thinking, parenthesis particularly with regard to theoretical paradigms themselves, if I may put it this way, close parenthesis, remains the same, even if the respective systems of thinking are transferred to other areas of universal phenomena. For example, when we are confronted with inanimate, inorganic nature, we need to establish certain analogies, particular frameworks of thought, a sum of interconnected thoughts, as a basis for defining theories of these inorganic or inanimate phenomena in nature. Then when we are trying to understand a different set of phenomena, for instance organic natural phenomena, we assume that we can simply expand that very same system of thoughts. We try to use the same causal understanding that is so productive in the area of inorganic matter in the realm of living beings, and to explain them with the very same concepts. Hence, from a conceptual point of view, we are trying to turn the area of living beings into the same functional system of causalities that we are forced to establish when dealing with inanimate or inorganic nature. We simply carry the paradigm we have adopted from inanimate nature over to organic nature. This is what we usually understand today under the expression expansion of ideas or of theories. 
What anthroposophy means by expansion of ideas, however, is quite the opposite. Anthroposophy should support a certain independent growth or metamorphosis of ideas when we move from one area of universal phenomena into another, so that we do not simply transfer to living nature what we have learned only from inorganic phenomena, even though it may seem logical. Thoughts concerning one particular area have to take different forms when they appear in another area, as comparably things in the living world change when they grow or when they go through metamorphosis and often become unrecognizable in the new form that they have taken. What remains always the same throughout all areas, giving the entire scholarly worldview a monistic character, is the way we relate to what we could call scholarly certainty, a concept fundamental for scholarly beliefs. Only those who are able to test why they cannot come to any satisfaction of causal human needs, if I may repeat the phrase of Dubois Raymond, if they use the same concepts they apply to inanimate nature, only those who really come to know this inwardly, would be able to transfer their experience to a different way of making arguments about the living world while using completely different concepts, even if these are only metamorphoses of earlier concepts. The the position the human being takes within the world of scholarship and science is definitely monistic throughout the entire scientific worldview. Misunderstanding this usually leads to the fact that people tend to ascribe a dualistic rather than a monistic character to the scientific anthroposophic worldview. The second reason for misinterpretations is phenomenology, which anthroposophy must acknowledge, particularly with respect to natural science. Precisely in the area of such a productive science read that again precisely in the area of such productive scientific developments at the time when the great natural scientist Virchow gave a speech about replacing the philosophical worldview with a scientific one, we learned that the productive concepts of inorganic matter, which, looking from an historical perspective, we have rightfully established, have in fact substantiated a certain rationalism in natural natural science. So, the era that, on the one hand, with regard to the external world of facts, was strongly focusing on empiricism, ended, on the other hand, with a powerful rationalism when scientists moved from observation to explaining the facts of nature they discovered through experience. In contrast, anthroposophy represents a viewpoint that, at least for me, if I may make this personal remark, is based on Goethe's understanding of nature. Anthroposophy is established on the foundation of a phenomenological understanding of nature. In modern times, this phenomenology was, in a way, explained again by Ernst Mach. The way he explains it makes it look as if it provides very productive viewpoints as long as we stay within its parameters. We can find Goethe's explanation in his statement that, quote, the world of phenomena is a theory in itself, and we do not need to take another step toward creating artificial theories, close quote. The blue of the sky is a phenomenon in which we do not have to look first for hypothetical, assumed explanations of the meta-phenomena in a rationalistic way through simple thoughts. This is how Goethe came to the realization of what he calls the original phenomenon. Many of Goethe's ideas concerning natural science have certainly been outdated in the very creative 19th century. Nevertheless, we could say that the methodology or the way of thinking that Goethe introduced into natural science is not only still relevant now, but it also, in my view, is not yet fully understood. I do realize that many or almost all the details of Goethe's explanations about natural science 
were outdated in the course of the 19th century. And yet I would like to refer to something I said before the end of the last century about Goethe's view of nature, that Goethe is both a Copernicus and a Kepler for natural science. I still repeat that statement today because I believe that the statements that follow are justifiable. How do we eventually come to a view of nature in the particular area in which the 19th century achieved so much? Parenthesis, I am not able to give other outlines for the things I mean to explain, except those of history. Close quote. Excuse me, close parenthesis. All the achievements of the 19th century in natural science led back to the application of mathematical methods with almost no exception. A mathematical way of thinking was fundamental even in those cases that did not directly concern mathematical methods. But where other things, excuse me, other kinds of causal thinking were used instead and where other theories were established. The following facts are indicative. We have seen that during the 19th century, certain branches of natural science were explained in a rationalistic way by using mathematics. We all know Kant's statement that in each science there is only as much certainty as there is mathematics. Now, we certainly cannot bring in mathematics everywhere. Causal explanations offer more possibilities than the producing of mathematical concepts. However, explanations based on causality do follow the patterns employed in mathematical concepts. When Ernst Mach aimed at an overview of this system of concepts from a phenomenological viewpoint, he had to look back at the concept of causality as well, and at the way this concept had developed in natural science during the 19th century to find the particular content of this concept. Finally, he concluded that if he could think of some effect and its cause in connection to each other, then this thought would represent nothing but the concept of a mathematical function. For example, if I said x equals y, having in mind that x is the cause and y the effect, then I have brought everything down to the concepts I use in mathematics when I produce a function. Thus we can see from the history of science how we have transferred the concepts of mathematics into natural science. Goethe, of course, is rightfully seen as a non-mathematician. After all, he defined himself as such. However, Considering him simply as a non-mathematician will lead to new misunderstandings. We would then assume that Goethe could not achieve a lot in the area of mathematics and that he was not particularly capable of solving the mathematical problems that existed at the time. And in fact, we should admit this. I even believe that as a person, Goethe would have not would have not had much patience for solving particular mathematical problems, especially if they were about algebra. We should admit this too. Nevertheless, as paradoxical as it may sound, Goethe was in a way more of a mathematical thinker than many mathematicians. He had a fine sense of the nature of mathematical processes, of the nature of producing mathematical concepts. He appreciated the kind of thinking that remains hidden in the inner soul process and in the content of imagination when concepts are constructed. When we construct mathematical concepts, we overlook our own internal process. A simple example would be the common proof that Euclidean geometry, excuse me, from Euclidean geometry of the three angles of a triangle, which add up to 180 degrees. If we draw a line across the top parallel to the baseline and we observe the newly created angles whose total as alternate angles is equal to the total of the other two angles of the triangle, 
the one in between remains the same, we can see that the, those three angles at the top add up to 180 degrees, or that their total equals the total of the three angles within the triangle. In any case, we overlook this fact. Excuse me, read that again. In case we overlook this fact, we still have mathematical proof. But at the same time, we have something that shows that we could be completely independent from external observation and could fail to see things in our internal process of constructing. Then, if we have an external triangle, we realize that we can prove through external facts, the same thing that we previously failed to see internally. This is true for mathematics in general. Everything appears in a way that does not require sense perception for us to come to what we call proof. At the same time, everything that we have figured out internally could always be proven bit by bit externally too. Goethe thought that what this special quality of mathematics represents is eminently scientific in character. And in that sense, he really did have a mathematical mind. This view was also the basis of the famous conversation about the method of scientific observation that Goethe and Schiller once had at the height of their friendship. They were both listening to a talk given by the natural scientist, scientist Batch, at the Jena Society of Natural Science. When they were leaving, Schiller made a comment about what they had just heard. He said to Goethe that this was a way of looking at nature in which one only takes things apart, and that it would never lead to anything that is whole. We can imagine that Bach had simply examined natural objects individually, one after the other. As was typical for the scientists of the time, he had failed to produce an argument that could have led to an overall view of nature. To Schiller, such an approach was unsatisfactory, and he expressed his disappointment to Goethe. Goethe told him that he knew how to bring some unity, some wholeness, into the way we look at nature, and with a few brief strokes, as he himself describes it, he began to outline the original plant in the way we could imagine it internally not as it is manifested in a specific plant that has roots and stem, leaves, blossoms, and fruit. In my introduction to Goethe's title Naturwissenschaftliche Schriften, parenthesis, Works Concerning Natural Science, close parenthesis, which I wrote in the 1880s, I tried to repeat the drawing that Goethe had sketched for Schiller on a piece of paper at the time. Back then, Schiller looked at the drawing and said something based on his own way of thinking. Quote, this is not an experience. This is an idea. Close quote. What Schiller meant by this was that one could draw something like that only if, one, only if it comes out of one's own imagination. This was something great as an idea, as a thought, but it had generally no physically existing source. But Goethe did not understand what Schiller meant and ended the conversation summarizing what they had said so far. Quote, if that's so, then I see my ideas with my eyes. Close quote. What did Goethe mean by that? He did not spell this out. But he meant that if he tried to draw a triangle, its angles would naturally add up to 180 degrees. No matter how many triangles he looked at, what he had constructed internally in this one triangle would apply to all triangles. Hence he made a conclusion based on something which came from inside himself and which now fully applies to his experience. This is how Goethe wanted to draw the original plant in a way similar to the original triangle. And this plant was supposed to show what we could find in any specific plant. In the same way that the angles of any triangle add up to 180 degrees, given that we have the original triangle, 
the ideal form of the original plant should be found in any particular plant throughout the full range of all plants. Goethe meant to shape science entirely in accordance with such a perception. In essence, though he never succeeded, he wanted to shape organic science using the same way of thinking that had proved to be productive in inorganic science. This became particularly clear when he wrote from Italy that he kept developing the idea of the original plant further and further. In this context, he said that looking at the plants in southern Italy and Sicily, at the variety of the flora there, he came to realize better and better what the original plant is. He thought that there must be some species that carries in itself the potential of all actual plants, a species that could vary in its form, that could adopt a variety of shapes, parenthesis, an elongated leaf or a leaf with a different form, close parenthesis, a species in which either the blossoms or the fruit would develop more, and so forth, as a triangle could be obtuse or acute. Goethe wanted to find a species that was a model for all plants. It is completely wrong to insist, as Schleiden later did, that with his original plant, Goethe meant an actual specific plant. This was absolutely untrue, as untrue as it would be to insist that a mathematician who speaks of a triangle has a certain physically existing triangle in mind. Goethe was talking about an image that could be created internally, but which could nevertheless be verified anywhere in the external world. This is why I see Goethe generally as being mathematically minded. He was more mathematically inclined than the astronomers. And this is what really matters. This is what made Goethe say to Schiller, quote, In that case I see my ideas with my eyes. Close quote. He saw them with his eyes because he could find them everywhere in all phenomena. He did not quite understand why some things are perceived only as ideas, because when he was producing ideas, he was in complete harmony with experience, exactly as the mathematician feels that he is in harmony with experience when producing mathematical ideas. However, I have to say that consequently, through an internal logic, this led Goethe to a mere phenomenology. In other words, he was not looking for anything else beyond appearance. And most important, he was not trying to create a rationalistic world of atoms. Now, in mentioning phenomenology, we come to a subject that has had many arguments directed against it. To me, the arguments are all based on misinterpretations. We are talking primarily about the fact that we consider a phenomenon to be anything that the external world offers to the senses, or anything that is part of experience or of an experiment. Goethe, and with him the entire scientific phenomenology, is trying not to jump from the sensory phenomenon directly to some atomic process hidden behind it. Rather, Goethe focuses primarily on the purely sensory phenomena and on the unique elements of sensory facts, without drawing a connection to anything behind them. What he searches for are simply elements in the phenomenal world that are related to each other and he tries to find the connections between them. I can fully understand where the respective misinterpretations come from, and how easy it is to see such phenomenology as unproductive. For example, one could say that if we limit ourselves to simply describing the interconnections between sensory phenomena, if we look only for the simplest phenomena in which the processes are most easily comprehensible, and which Goethe calls original phenomena, then our approach will never lead us to understanding the very productive discoveries of modern chemistry. One could ask how we could deal with atomic weight relationships without any understanding of the world of atoms. In this case, 
one might want to ask a counter-question. If we become aware of a given phenomenon, would it be necessary to distance ourselves from it? We certainly would not have to do this. Even when we compute atomic weight relationships, we still have to deal with a phenomenon, namely with weight relationships. Would it bring us any further to try to explain the same weight relationships which are expressed in numbers in a purely rational, intellectual way through the fact that from the atomic weights we produce certain molecular structures? We could ask that question, couldn't we? To summarize, from Goethe's perspective, this is all about the fact that we should stay within the realm of phenomena. Here I would like to give a very simple example. Let us assume that we are given a written word to look at. What do we do? Well, if we have never learned how to read, we will stare at it as if it is something inexplicable. But if we have learned how to read, then unconsciously we will put together the different forms of the letters and we will experience the meaning of the word in our soul. One thing we certainly would not do is try to explain the meaning of the word on the basis of the form, say of W, considering the beginning of the upward stroke and then the one going downward, thinking that in this way we will discover some something profoundly significant about that letter. In other words, we will be reading rather than trying to explain things through assumptions. This is how phenomenology wants to read. It wants to stay within the context of phenomena and it wants to learn how to read. And if it has to deal with a complex of phenomena, it does not want to go back from that complex to the small atomic structures. Hence, this is all about accepting the realm of the phenomenal and about learning how to read its own internal meaning. Such an approach will bring us to a kind of natural science that will contain nothing rationalistic constructed beyond the phenomena. Instead, simply by the way it views phenomena, the science will find certain regular structures. This kind of natural science will always represent the sum of the phenomena themselves. People will speak in a very particular manner about nature. The laws of nature will be content excuse me, the laws of nature will be the content of such a manner of speaking. But the phenomena themselves will always be at the foundation of the forms of expression. This is how we can achieve what I would like to call a natural science immanent in the phenomena. This is the kind of science Goethe was seeking. His methods, however, will have to be updated in the light of the progress achieved today. Nevertheless, the basic principle could be preserved. And if we do preserve this basic principle, we cannot but discover something important about our human perception of nature that I, want to, that I would like to characterize as follows. It is understandable that contemporary humanity has established its concepts of natural science primarily on the basis of inorganic nature. The reason is that inorganic natural phenomena are relatively simple. In addition, there are processes of the inanimate world that certainly continue to act when we move up into the realm of organic matter. When we move from the kingdom of minerals to the vegetable kingdom, we cannot say that there are no inanimate processes in the plant. They are included in a higher principle but they persist in the plant. We are right to explore physical and chemical processes in the plant organism as we would explore them in inorganic nature. In this case, however, we should be able to accept modified metamorphosed concepts in our paradigms. We should follow how the same processes found in inanimate nature are extended to plants too. Scientists are tempted, however, to follow only those processes that originate in the kingdom of minerals and extend to plants and animals, while failing to consider what else is happening in the higher natural kingdoms. 
This temptation became extremely strong because of particular circumstances over the course of the 19th century. This is how that happened. When we observe inanimate nature, we feel deeply satisfied in a way because we can follow the phenomena with a mathematical kind of thinking. I would say that it was completely understandable when in his speech, quote, on the limits of our cognition of nature, close quote, Dubois Raymond celebrated Laplace's worldview, which, in splendid and rich language, he called, quote, the astronomic conception, close quote, of the entire existence of nature. According to this astronomic conception, with the help of mathematical thinking, we can grasp not only the various phenomena of the firmament and construct with them, as much as possible, one undivided whole, but we can also try to dive deep down into the constitution of matter. We are trying to construct a small universal system in the molecule, where the atoms move and relate to each other as do the stars in the universe. In this way, we construct the smallest universal systems in our small-scale world. We are satisfied, because in this small-scale world, we find the same laws that apply to the large-scale universe. We know, for example, that the atoms and molecules represent a system of moving particles like the system of fixed stars and planets out there in the universe. This example is characteristic primarily of the intellectual quests of the 19th century and of the way in which the human need for causality is satisfied, as Dubois Raymond says. This is simply the result of the desire to apply certain productive methods from the area of mathematics to all natural phenomena. It is also the basis of the temptation to remain at the level of mathematics when we observe all sorts of different phenomena in nature. Unless we speak about those things like amateurs, no one, not even an anthroposophist, would deny that there are logical explanations of all those facts when we look from within the phenomena and when we try to understand the details, say, about astronomy in this context. No one will disagree with such explanations. What happened during the 19th century, however, was a failure to see the qualitative elements in what the world offers. Rather, people saw only what was manifested, what could be comprehended with the help of mathematics, even though that was all part of the qualitative too. We have to make a distinction. We can certainly admit that this mechanical explanation of the world is completely plausible, no objections. But it makes a difference whether we declare a mechanical explanation to be reasonable in certain areas or whether we want to present it as the only possible system of concepts, using it to explain every single thing in the world. This is the point where opinions differ. Anthroposophists do not deny or fight against the things that are legitimate. In fact, it is interesting to observe how in discussions anthroposophy accepts everything that is within legitimate limits. The goal of anthroposophy is certainly not to deny what natural science asserts. The question is whether it is legitimate to try to explain the entire world of phenomena through mathematical thinking. Should we take from the sum of phenomena only the mathematical causal abstraction and treat it as an imagined universal content, as, for example, the former atomism did? Today, atomism has become to a certain degree phenomenological, and up to a point, anthroposophy agrees with it. The problem is that today's atomism is affected by the ghost of the 19th century and it is in complete contradiction to Goethe who was not limited to phenomena but established a paradigm beyond them. If we are not clear about the fact that science now uses only one paradigm, one system of concepts to express the world beyond appearance and if in confusion we adopt the false view 
that with this system of concepts we have captured something real, then this very system will actually mislead us. Because of it, we will become dogmatists. We will say that although there are people who want to explain the world of organic nature with completely different concepts, there are no such concepts. We will think we have already established paradigms that cover the world beyond the phenomena. We will think that the world of our concepts is the only one and it must work somehow with regard to the organic too. In this way, however, we would apply everything that we have established regarding inorganic matter to the observation of organic matter. We would begin to look at organic matter as if it originates in the same way as the inorganic does. Here we have to be very clear. Without complete clarity, we will never be able to establish the foundation for a real discussion. Anthroposophy has no desire to commit the sin of superficiality against any legitimate methods. It does not want to sin against what is legitimate in atomism. However, anthroposophy wants to clear the way for the establishing of thought systems similar to those established earlier in the study of inorganic matter. Systems that should now be established in other areas of nature too. This could happen only if we say to ourselves, reading is the goal of looking at phenomena. In other words, what I see as the essence of natural laws is already in the phenomena, in the same way that the meaning I discover when I read a word is already in the letters. If I remain with the phenomena lovingly, and I do not attempt to impose some kind of hypothetical thought system on reality, then my sense of science will be free to develop new concepts. This ability to remain free is what we need to establish. We should not restrict ourselves to the use of one paradigm when we shift to examining a different area of nature, even if the first one was rightfully established. We can develop a completely different relationship to thinking if we establish a pure phenomenology, something that would certainly be possible only if we come to the natural laws by interspersing the phenomena that we look at or that we present through experiments with thoughts and if we make connections between them. In other words, only by remaining within the phenomena can we experience how natural laws that appear in our thoughts are already present in the phenomena themselves? If we accept this idea, it will make no sense to speak about an opposition, in quotes, between subjective thoughts and natural phenomena, at least not insofar as we remain within the phenomena. We simply submerge ourselves in the phenomena and then in the essence of natural laws the essence of thoughts is given to us, coming directly from the phenomena. This is why Goethe remarked naively, quote, Then I see my ideas, close quote, which were actually natural laws in nature, quote, with my eyes. Close quote. If this is our approach to the phenomena in inorganic nature, then it will be possible to transfer it to organic nature including the scientific study of organic nature. And if we see then that a horse is brown or white, we are not going to ascribe this phenomenon to inorganic colors. Instead, we will see it in relation to something that lives as a spiritual or a soul being in an organism. The created inner organization will teach us to understand that animals as well as plants give themselves a color. In that case, we should certainly be able to observe internally all the details, how metabolism works, for example. But then we do not simply transfer to the organic what we have found in the inorganic. We do not restrict ourselves to one particular paradigm. And we do not rigidly carry our attitudes from one particular area into all others. 
We keep thinking in a more mathematical way than those who do not want to see concepts metamorphosed into qualitative categories. This is how we validate inner seeing when it comes to the higher realms of natural existence. How we validate inner seeing when it comes to inanimate mathematical constructs. This is only a brief outline of all these things. Further development would show that anthroposophy is really capable of accounting to anyone, including the strongest mathematician, as Goethe put it. This was Goethe's goal when he formulated his idea of the original plant, or with his idea of the original animal, which, however, he did not develop further. This is also the goal of anthroposophy, to take from Goethe's views everything that concerned phenomena in nature and to move from the understanding of what lives in our imagination to the type of the plant or the type of the animal. I demonstrated already in the 1880s that we should metamorphose the concepts that we apply to inorganic nature and in that way adapt them to organic nature. I will be discussing this further in the next few days. In this way, however, we also begin to see what the real driving or creative principle of organic nature is. To this observation, I would like to add something that will show that anthroposophy does not underestimate the materialistic phase in the development of natural science, a statement I will comment on again in the next few days. Anthroposophy should see this materialistic phase of natural science as a transition as a method of learning how to yield to the pure sensory experience. This phase was highly educational for human civilization. We can have a clear overview of certain things only after we have experienced this kind of learning. Only one who is armed with such a sense of science can observe the external material world and see how the external material world mirrors itself within us, if if I may use this expression. The world, as we experience it in ourselves, is more or less an abstraction, an image of the external material world, interwoven with our senses and impulses of will. Thus, when we move from observing the external material world to observing the spiritual world, we come to the purely imagined. Let us hold on to this point. Externally, we have all the material phenomena that we observe in a phenomenological sense. Internally, we have the spiritual, the psychic, in a certain abstract form, in the form of an image. If, however, we observe with an anthroposophic worldview the things that spiritually are at the foundation of the external material world, if we enter the spirit that is active in the motion of the stars and in the formation of the minerals and plants and animals, then we enter the spiritual in the very coming into being of the external world. We come to know it through imagination, inspiration and intuition which also give us an inner image of the human. But what is this inner image of the human? These are our physical organs. They now correspond to what I had learned before as the nature of the sun, the moon, minerals, plants, animals, and of other things. This is what the internal human organs correspond to. We can get to know our own human organism only if we get to know the external world. The material world outside us is reflected in the spiritual and the psychic within us. And the spiritual world outside us is reflected within us in the forms of lungs, of liver, of heart, and so forth. If we look at our internal organs, we will see that they are in the same relationship to the external spiritual world as our thoughts and feelings are to the external material world. This demonstrates that anthroposophy is not over-eager to reject materialism. But let us look at the entire range of sciences. 
We will not be satisfied with the results of thousands of them using the traditional methods. By contrast, anthroposophy will achieve a worldview through its methods that does not leave us unsatisfied. It recognizes the physical material both in the inner organization of the human and in the phenomenology of the surrounding world. At the same time, anthroposophy has to recognize that this inner organization is a result, a consequence of the spiritual in the cosmos. Therefore, it wants to complete what astrophysics, physics or chemistry have achieved through mathematics alone. Anthroposophy will do this in the form of an organic cosmology and it will continue to search until it brings us to a better understanding of the material aspect of the human being. Such methods are fundamental to the understanding that anthroposophy can develop also in service to medicine, biology and so forth. I hope that with these brief comments I have pointed out why anthroposophy, if we understand it correctly, is not in opposition to contemporary science. Instead, it seems to me that contemporary scientists have not found the bridge that shows that anthroposophy strives to be strictly scientific with regard to natural phenomena. The end of Lecture 1 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses that provide us with not only permission to record these, but also give us the English translations of Rudolf Steiner and uh, consider patronizing them. They are steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in uh, England. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies. And Seven Lectures, that's Collected Works, Volume 81, translated by Judith Vermuth Atkinson. And this is Lecture 2, entitled On the Organization of Humans and of Animals, given in Berlin on March 6, 1922. Most honored participants, I would like to ask you to keep in mind that until last night I was assuming that today I would attend this lecture given by Dr. Kalisko rather than give it myself. Thus, in the short time I had, it was impossible to prepare properly what I am going to say. And I can only hope that, by and large, I will be able to present the points that Dr. Kalisko wanted to talk to you about. When we speak about the relationship of the animal world to the world of the human being, from an anthroposophic perspective, we should emphasize that historically there is a connection between present anthroposophic ideas and Goethe's worldview, a fact I have already mentioned twice. Regarding the topic in question, we should consider most of all one of Goethe's first achievements in the area of science, his treatise titled Humans as well as Animals Have an Intermaxillary Bone in the upper jaw. We have to imagine all the circumstances that led Goethe to write this treatise, which is based on his extensive studies in the areas of anatomy and physiology, and on some embryological studies. Goethe became involved with these questions first as a young student, and then later as a friend of the Jena University Institutes, which to a certain degree depended on him. When he started dealing with the question of the main difference between human and animal, Goethe realized that everyone was eager to find something in the structure or the morphology of humans and of animals that would point to a strict distinction between the animal world and the human being, the crowning glory of creation. People believed they had found a profound difference between human and animal precisely in the structure of the head, in the fact that the so-called intermaxillary bone, which in animals is clearly separated from all other jaw bones, is not a separate bone in the human being. Goethe did not pay attention to that. 
since human and animal have in general an analogous structure, he was convinced that that such a detail could not express differentiation. Since in adult individuals the intermaxillary bone has grown together with the rest of the jaw bones, Goethe was trying to prove that this is the result of a later development and that the human embryo has the same intermaxillary bone structure as the animals. We should observe the enthusiasm with which Goethe points out that he had succeeded in demonstrating that both animals, excuse me, that both humans and animals have an intermaxillary bone, and that consequently there is no profound difference between them to be found in details of their structure or morphology. Thus we cannot say that Goethe shared the view of the strict separation of the human from the animal world that was characteristic of the 18th century, and anthroposophy does not share this view either. Goethe did assume a transformation in the process of development from the organization of animals to the higher organization of humans. The individual organs that are already present in the animal are transformed. Once the organs are transformed, they can manifest in this transformed animal organization the inner world of the human, the human being as a whole. Goethe thought only of an ascending metamorphosis of the animal world into the human, and not of an independent human morphology. This viewpoint should also be the basis of our anthroposophic search for the differentiation between the animal and the human organism. If the forms of organization are based simply on the metamorphosis of the animal and of the human, then looking for the differentiation, we should observe particularly the processes of life in humans and in animals how the organs of humans and of animals function. In other words, we should look for a biological rather than for a morphological difference. The idea that there is a biological difference anticipates future scientific developments by examining the foundation of the functioning in animals or that which is related to the sensory organs in both humans and animals. Sensory organs, or rather their functions, are vital for more or less everything that is happening in both animal and human organisms. We should assume that some functions of a primitive form of the senses occur even in the simplest nutritional processes in the metabolism of the lower rank of animals. This would mean that, for example, the experience of taste occurs parallel to the more or less purely chemical process of metabolism. These processes become more and more differentiated as we follow the development of higher animals up to the human being. However, if we analyze animal organization objectively, we will never find anything that does not involve some form of sensory experience. We can certainly ask how this sensory experience relates to the formation of lymph or of blood and so forth. Currently, science that is not influenced by anthroposophy speaks of the unconscious processes of the human psyche. Even though I can mention this only briefly because of insufficient time, I would say that it is plausible to ask why we assume that the experience of taste in the mouth and at the gum, the experience of taste that occurs under the influence and because the function of tyalin or pepsin and so forth, is not brought to the con- is not brought to the unconscious. Why should the experience of taste, and I am saying this as a postulate of sorts, not expand throughout the entire organism? Why do we not think that unconscious experiences of taste might be occurring parallel with the formation of lymph and blood and all other processes in the organs of which we are not conscious? Once we begin to observe the life of the senses, 
we will certainly be able to analyze human and animal organization from a biological perspective. As I have been telling some of you for years, and as natural science already accepts, the life of the senses occurs in more than the five senses usually mentioned. There are actually twelve clearly distinguished human senses. This applies only to the human being. Those who recognize the possibility of more than the five or six senses seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, touching will accept that it is justifiable to speak, for example, of a sense of balance. This sense allows us to recognize internally whether we stand on two feet or only on one, whether we perform a movement with one or the other arm, and so forth. When we place ourselves in the world as human beings, we take a position of balance. We perceive our own position of balance with our senses, just as we perceive what occurs in the process of seeing, though in a somewhat more obscure way. Hence, we can talk about a sense of balance as surely as we talk about a sense of sight. We should be clear that when we use the sense of balance, we are focusing on our own organization. In a way, we look inward. While using our eyes, we look outward. Nevertheless, the basis of our experience of balance is certainly some function of the senses. We could expand the number of senses in another direction, too. When we simply hear a noise, the functional processes of the human organism are substantially different from the processes of listening to speech, which is a different kind of hearing. In hearing speech, we perceive, again, directly through our ears, but we focus also on what we perceive indirectly through language. When we follow the words, the sentences of another person, using our inner understanding, then we are dealing with more than our judgment. The process of judgment is preceded by a sensory process of perception. Therefore, we should speak of having a, quote, sense of speech, close quote, or rather a sense of language or of words, like our sense of hearing. Put in another way, if we look at words from a, from a more anatomical or physiological viewpoint, we should assume that within the organization of the human, there exists a special organization of the senses that corresponds with listening to what is said, just as the organization of the hearing sense corresponds with listening to unarticulated sounds. Consequently, we should assume the existence of a special organization of the sense of speech that is similar to any other sense organization, such as the sights of sight, excuse me, such as the senses of sight or hearing. If we approach this objectively, we should not say that we recognize another human being because we see things like a nose, two eyes, and so forth. We should not make an assumption, based on analogy, that in this thing that stands before us there is a human being simply because in ourselves there is a human being that reveals itself in the outer world through a nose, through eyes, and so forth. In fact, such an unconscious conclusion is not the basis of recognizing another human. Rather, there is an immediate grasping of the other human that must correspond with something special in the human organization, something that can be compared only to the organization of senses. In fact, we could speak of a sense of the self that helps us recognize ourselves in the other. If we understand the functioning of the human being completely objectively, we will be as justified to speak of sensory organizations for the perception of words, of thoughts, and of the self, not of one's own self, however, which is based on something totally different. As we are in speaking of the sensory organization, of hearing, of speaking, and so forth. Furthermore, we should be able to speak of a sense of movement, since it is one thing to move and another to stand still, and we perceive the difference. Similarly, we should speak of a sense of life, 
Natural science already speaks of it to a degree. If we define in this way the number of sense organization systems, we will come up with twelve human senses. Some of them, however, are inner senses, since we perceive our inner organism as well. We perceive how we feel with regard to our sense of balance or to our sense of movement. Nevertheless, the quality of our experience of the inner organization is absolutely the same as the quality of the processes of seeing, hearing, or tasting. Thus, it is all about looking at things in the right context. If we take as a starting point an integral physiology of human senses, we will see certain significant biological phenomena both in humans and in animals. The significance of these phenomena will remain the same, even if we completely agree with the new theories of the relationship between the morphological and physiological organization of humans and that of animals, including with Haeckel's theory. Here, however, we can observe the most impossible misunderstandings. For example, it is believed that anthroposophy must be opposed to Haeckel's theory simply because anthroposophy is trying to progress from observation through sense perception to the higher level of empirical observation of the spiritual. It is believed that based on this background, anthroposophy must change something in Haeckel's theory. No. If there is anything to be corrected in Haeckel's theory, it should be done using the methods of natural science, and anthroposophy has nothing to say about it. Natural scientists can argue with Haeckel themselves. What anthroposophy has to say relates to a completely different area. We have the right to emphasize that if we count the bones of the higher animals, the number will be the same as that in human beings. The same applies to the number of muscles. But this is not the way to differentiate between human and animal organization. However, if we approach the issue from the viewpoint of biology, then we see a real differentiation. Then we come to appreciate the fact that the human organization has an essentially different place in the universe from that of animals. When we observe the higher animals, we have to say that an important element of their development is the position of their spinal axis, which is parallel to the surface of the ground, while in humans it is just the opposite. In the process of human development, the horizontal position of the spine has changed into a vertical one, and thus one of the most important functions of humans is to stand in an upright position. I realize that people could object and point out that there are also animals that have a more or less vertical spinal axis. The question, however, is not how a species appears in relation to an external morphology, but what the nature of its entire organization is. In particular animals, such as some birds or even mammals, the possibility that their spines could be brought more or less to an upright position is an assumption. In fact, an upright position would be a sign of degeneration, considering the nature of the animal's organization. By contrast, for humans to have an upright position of the spine is precisely in the nature of their organization. Once, years ago, when I mentioned this at a lecture in Munich, an educated natural scientist came up to me and said something I could understand very well. Quote, but when we sleep, the spine is, nevertheless, in a horizontal position. Close quote. I told him that this is not what matters. What is important is how the spine is positioned in relation to, say, the bones of the legs or the feet in relation to the rest of the body, considering the entire cosmic context of the human being, and also how this positioning affects the human or the animal. Our spine is certainly in a horizontal position when we sleep, but this horizontal position is external. The inner dynamics of our body are organized in a way that allows us to take an upright position of balance in which the spinal axis is vertical. 
when animals bring themselves to such a position of balance, they are either degenerated to a certain degree or they develop some human-like functions, a fact that only proves what I would like to explain next. We could say that already in the first years of life, human beings find for themselves their own position in the balance of the universe. They form the vertical position of their spine, a position that is different from that of the animals for purely functional reasons, because of the entire dynamics of their being. At the same time, each being is formed as part of the entire universe, and one could say that beings adjust to the universe. I will not elaborate on this right now. Observe further the structure of particular bones in the human being, such as the ribs or the skull. We see in the forms of the ribs or the skull of a human or of a dog that from a morphological point of view it is possible to find signs of adjustment to the vertical or horizontal position of the spine. By positioning themselves vertically, humans live a completely different life compared to that of animals standing on four legs. They live in a different position of balance and thus in a different cosmic context. Now let us try to approach the problem from a different angle and clarify what is really happening in the human being in terms of sensory processes and what is happening as a consequence of those sensory processes. All this could be translated into a very precise biological or physiological terminology, but because of insufficient time, here I will only outline what I want to discuss. Let us consider the visual process. We could subdivide it into the specific functions of the visual organ and into the processes that occur further as a continuation on the physical level. What I want to stress here as analogy is the fact that the optic nerve begins in the eye and then disappears in the rest of the system of nerves. Hence we can distinguish between the visu visual process itself and what follows in the whole process of life. The imaginative element is also inherent in the immediate visual process. That is, when we look at something, we do not separate the imaginative element from the visual process. If we turn our eyes away from the object we are looking at, we still retain its image, an image that is clearly related to the object perceived in the visual process. Those who analyze this correctly would see how different the imaginative result of a visual process is from that of an auditory process. Within ourselves, I want to stress, we experience the visual process in a dualistic form. On the one hand, there is something related to the real sense perception, and on the other hand, there is something that is like an imaginative remnant and that stays with us more or less as a formed memory. Take now everything that lives in the human imagination, but that is based on the five senses. Most of what is in the psychic life of the human is based on the visual process. We perceive very few imaginations through the auditory process in comparison to the number of things we perceive in the visual process. If we observe the inner life of our psyche, we will find even fewer things that are based entirely on it alone than the things that are based on the processes of seeing, hearing, and so forth. We do know that the imaginative element, which leads to lasting memories, plays some role in the life of our psyche, but this role is much less significant than the role of the visual and auditory processes. We can now pose the question, does this duality exist also in the cases of the more hidden senses, such as the sense of balance or of motion? Is it the same duality we see in the visual sense, between the element of perception and the element of imagination? To a really objective physiology or psychology, this duality should exist in the case of the sense of balance too. But we usually fail to see the connection. In the previous lecture I just gave, I discussed mathematics, 
and the ability to find one's way in spatial relations where the mathematical element is used for the purposes of geometry. What is it really that we are doing when we construct spatial relations? With respect to the human being as a whole, we do exactly the same as when we clearly separate perception from imagination in the visual process by retaining the image internally. We perceive a color not only externally, we also experience the qualitative element of the color, the nuance, and we even have the feeling of a warm or of a cool color, a feeling that persists internally. Thus, we could take as a task at some point in an extensive inspection of the psyche to collect all the images that we have established in life because of our ability to see. Then we could achieve an inner visual system in our psyche. We would have built a reconstruction of the external visual process. If you consider the same possibility with regard to the sense of balance, you will come to the realization that through everything you have experienced in your organism because of your sense of balance, you have reconstructed internally something that corresponds to the geometry of the external world. We did not discover mathematics or mechanics from external experience. We discovered these laws through internal constructing. If you imagine certain mechanical laws, you have discovered them on the basis of the imaginative element of your sense of balance. In this case, our entire being becomes a sense organ and we construct internally the other pole, the opposite of perception. For example, we create mathematics and believe that in it we have a pure a priori science. But mathematics is not a pure a priori science. We simply fail to see that we transform the experience of our sense of balance into mathematical and geometrical images in the same way visual perception is transformed into visual images. Without our noticing this bridge, the perceptions of our sense of balance are transformed into mathematics and mechanics. If we keep this in mind, we will understand the inner connection between the complex human organism and its position of balance in the universe. Then we will realize that the particular experience of balance reflected internally in animals who stand on their forelegs and whose position affects the very content of their sense of balance must be very different from the human experience of balance that is reflected in mathematics. We will consider mathematics to be the result of our specific upright position in the universe. We speak of three dimensions because we are positioned in three dimensions in the universe. However, we have reached the vertical dimension thanks only to our own effort in the course of our life. We had to position ourselves in the vertical dimension. Our experience from early childhood is reflected later in mathematics, but this process of reflection does not happen as fast as it does in the visual process. The experience of balance is being reflected in us throughout our lives. As children, we experience our sense of balance in a very strong way when we change from crawling to standing and walking. This change is reflected later in mathematics and mechanics. Often we consider mathematics to be something that we have created. That is not the case. Mathematics is based on the perception of our own organism. Why do we have thoughts that we can relate to the universe so that out of them we can build a whole universe in our thoughts? This is only the result of the way the human being is positioned in the universe. And if we compare now the animal's position of balance with regard to the universe to that of humans, we can see that animals are bound to the organization of the earth. Humans, on the other hand, by standing in an upright position, lift themselves up away from the organization of the earth. 
Our ability to express independent thoughts is a consequence of human beings having achieved an independent position of balance. As we see, our upright position in the universe is an achievement that is more deliberate than simply following the laws of the organism, and this is not found in animals. In establishing their organism, humans can achieve this only in the first years of life. It is a process that affects every single organ. This is how we come to a polarity within the human being. On the one hand, humans stand and walk in an upright position. And everything that started out the same in humans and in animals has to be adjusted to this cosmic position in which humans exist. On the other hand, the soul gives birth to thoughts that transcend the sense perception of what we see or perceive with the five senses. Thoughts that in fact liberate us from sense perception. Humans detach themselves from the earth through their position in relation to the universe. In the same way, thoughts free themselves from their bond to the sensory world and become in a sense emancipated. Because of my anthroposophic certainty, I would like to pose the following as something more than a postulate. We must see the position of balance, which we have because of the upright position of our spinal axis, as something that separates humans from the animals. At the same time, we should see the special form of imagination, thoughts, as something specifically human. Those of you who can understand these things from an anthroposophic viewpoint, I will touch on this topic later, can also see that through the particular development of their sense of balance and their sense of motion, humans achieve a more emancipated system of thinking than one based only on the experience of the eyes or the ears. Having understood this, you would also see that for emancipated thinking, the human being must have an inner organization as well. The human being possesses an organization that is simply not to be found in animals, a fact that could surely be proven in material terms. This organization serves the very specific system of thoughts that has emancipated itself from the bond to the earth that animals still have, a form determined by the special human position of balance. Hence, we can say that the human being has established an organ of abstract thinking by coming to an upright posture of the body. So we see in humans an organization determined by their upright position that at first glance shows nothing more than that the organs, which are the same as those in animals, are in a different position in humans. However, this upright posture affects the organization of the nerves and of the blood. Under the influence of this different position of balance, humans develop something that animals cannot have. And here we find the biological difference between humans and animals. This difference is to be found in the physical organization of the human and not simply in some theory of metaphysics. This is of fundamental importance. Imagine the transformation of the organization that occurs through the change in the position of balance from the animal to the human. Think, for example, of the changes in the thigh, the lower leg, the hands, and so forth. Imagine what it means to have two hands and not four legs. In fact, humans are supplied with the same forms as animals, but the forms are positioned differently and thus have changed or metamorphosed. This could be proven also in terms of anatomy once the necessary tools and methods of experimentation are developed. We are searching for such tools and methods of experimentation in our institutes in Stuttgart, but to find such methods externally and empirically, we should first form in our imagination an idea about what the differences must be. Anthroposophy is not useless regarding the study of the subtle areas of science, such as the study of human, animal, and plant forms, since science does not discover th these things through imagination. Once they are discovered, however, 
they can be validated through science. Looking at the changes caused in organs by the upright position of balance, we can also see that some organs have been transformed into organs of speech. In other words, the organism becomes creative also with regard to speech. We have now an impression of the special organization of the human being that was established simply because humans are an upright walking species, a fact that has consequences reaching deep into the physical world. We have also made conclusions regarding the physiological organism of speech, a place where we cannot define any morphological differences between humans and animals, even though we see differences in a biological sense. These are only a few thoughts that could show how something we search for in an external, profane manner could be studied in really scientific terms. Today I could only outline briefly what I wanted to say. However, if you imagine pursuing these thoughts, then science will certainly find a way to explore the differences between human and animal organization in terms of biology. The end of Lecture 2 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. And in that regard... There are two publishing houses that uh, uh, translate Steiner into, Germ- uh, into English for us and also give me permission to do these recordings. And they are steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in London. Please consider patronizing those organizations directly uh, if you're purchasing books and the like. They uh, help us do this immensely. Uh, this is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies. Uh, it is seven lectures, Collected Works Volume 81, translated by Judith Wormuth Atkinson. This is Lecture 3, entitled Anthroposophy and Philosophy, given in Berlin on March 7, 1922. Most honored participants, It is always difficult when, having a serious scholarly conscience, one tries to translate what we have inherited in the concept of Logos into one of the modern languages. When we want to translate Logos, we usually say word, as the Bible does. However, when we have in mind logic, we do not think as much of word as of a thought, of the way thought functions in the human individual, and of its patterns. For philosophy, though, in quotes, logos means, excuse me, for philology, though, logos, in quotes, means consciousness, in quotes. We develop scholarship that is based on the word. I mean that what we understand under logos today, according to modern language use, is the basis of all philosophy. And when we speak of philosophy, we can sense the reflection of an undefined experience of of Logos in everything that we do not define but rather experience as philosophy. At the time when philosophy was established, the meaning of the word Logos was undoubtedly something more than simply its literal meaning. It implied a particular inner experience of the human being. The word philosophy implies that the human had a certain interest, Sophia, in everything that was related to Logos. This was an interest that, if not personal, was certainly generally human. The understanding of the word philosophy was related more to the inner attitude of the human being toward the wisdom-filled content of science than to the possession of scientific knowledge itself. Our sense of philosophy is not as certain today as it was at the time when the concept of philosophy overlapped with the desire for scientific knowledge. Parenthesis, I would not say it overlapped with science itself. Close parenthesis. The word pointed at the same time to an inner human attitude. As a consequence, our inner feeling when we speak of or deal with philosophy now is extremely unclear. If we try to determine it externally or simply in a dialectical way, 
it is also very difficult to bring this unclear feeling out of the depth of our consciousness. Our present time requires, rather, that we try to explore the human experience of philosophy in the course of our historical development. Precisely this latter kind of understanding is required. If as Central Europeans we look back a few decades, we will see that specifically in Central Europe, the experience of those who wished to enter into the spirit of philosophy was different from our experience now in the second decade of the 20th century. Today we have experienced so much more compared with what people experienced in earlier times through the course of many centuries. We may say that we have more experience, not only in a physical sense, but also in a spiritual sense. And if we look back at the experiences that a student of philosophy could have had as a Central European during the 50s, 60s, and 70s of the 19th century, or even later, we will find basically that they were mainly the following. Scholars looked back at the peak of the development of German philosophy, at the great time of the philosophers Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel. Then scholars looked at the world around them, which consisted of educated and knowledgeable people who regarded that era of philosophy as something outdated and who believed that the rising scientific views should replace the earlier philosophical observations. While they admired the greatness of the sublime thought that could be seen in someone like Schelling and were fascinated by the energy and power of Fichte's intellectual development, and had, perhaps, some sense of Hegel's far-reaching creative thinking, people saw this era of classical German philosophy as something science had already surpassed. At the same time, there was a desire to develop something based on natural science that would become a worldview. We can find this desire everywhere from the aspirations of the scientists concerning, quote, force and matter, close quote, to those thinkers who were more careful in trying to achieve a philosophical worldview based on natural science, but who also rejected the former idealistic philosophy. Thus, in this area, there were all sorts of nuances in thinking as well as in research. There was also a third type of thinker, they were not able to go along with explanations of a worldview based simply on natural science. Neither could they go as deeply into the reality of thought as Hegel did. These thinkers were confronted with the big question, how could people relate the objective outside world to their thinking, which was formed as something that existed only within themselves? So the specialists in the theory of knowledge unanimously called for, quote, turning back to Kant, close quote, though each found a very different way back to Kant. These were intelligent thinkers like Liebmann, Volkelt, and so forth, who remained, however, mainly in the thought frame of theory of knowledge. They did not find an answer to the question of how human thought could bridge over to an external, trans-subjective reality using images of their own internal thinking. The situation that I am describing to you here, the one in which the students of philosophy found themselves in the last third of the 19th century, did not bring any resolution. In a sense, it was as if they were in the middle of a drama or in the middle of a piece of art that was developing in time, a piece of art to which no one had found an end yet. The scholarly aspirations were running into the indefinite, They were ending with a large number of questions, but the courage, even merely to attempt to resolve those questions, was missing everywhere. The reality now is that the situation in the entire world of philosophy appears to be very different from the situation in the last third of the 19th century, which I just described. Now we face philosophical views that have a completely different foundation and they force us to characterize the current philosophical situation in a completely different way. 
if we would like to characterize the situation in philosophy today. With the eyes of our soul we would see, clearly, something for which our vision was sharpened in the first two decades of the twentieth century, namely the extremely different philosophical views of Western, of Central, and of Eastern Europe. Today our inward experience of philosophy is different from the one even of the recent past. It is an experience to which we can associate three names, Herbert Spencer, Hegel, and Vladimir Soloviev. These three personalities are the representatives of everything that characterizes the situation in philosophy today. Inwardly, this has always been the case, or at least it has been the case for a very long time. But only today we can see this situation so clearly before us. Let us look at the West. Herbert Spencer If I want to be precise, I should describe the details of the entire development of this philosophical view, how it led from Bacon and Locke through Mill to Spencer. This tracing of history, however, is not my task today. In Herbert Spencer, we see someone who wanted to justify philosophy, but he wanted to justify philosophy using only systems of concepts established in natural science. Spencer unconditionally says yes to natural science and draws conclusions only on the basis of his own affirmation that philosophical thinking about the world must be founded in natural science. We can see that Spencer is trying to grasp certain concepts of natural science, such as the concept that describes how matter constantly shrinks and expands, and the concepts of differentiation and consolidation. For example, he observes certain processes in the plant that expands in its leaves and shrinks the seed into its germ. He tries to define such concepts in clear scientific terms to establish a worldview in this way. He even tries to think of human society, of the social organism, in a way that would present an analogy to the biological organism. This, however, immediately creates a problem. The biological organism of the human being is dependent on the combination of everything that helps this organism to relate to the external world, for example, through perception, through imagination, and so forth. Each individual organism is dependent on the particular developments influenced by the sensory system. Herbert Spencer does not find a similar sensory system in the social organism. No central coordinating nervous system is to be found there. Nevertheless, built entirely on the foundation of natural science, he produces such a social organism and in a way sees it as the crowning element of his philosophical construct. What does this actually mean in the Western world? It means that in the West, scientific thinking has developed in its fullest, in its legitimate one-sidedness. It means a fine ability of observation and a talent for experimentation have developed from the original dispositions of the different peoples. It means that there is definite interest in observing the external sensory reality down to the smallest detail without being impatient and wanting to rush to generalizations. It also means that there is a trend toward keeping science in the frame of the external sensory world of facts. It means that there is some fear, as I would call it, of expanding from the sensory world to a larger frame, to an all-embracing world. Since the human being, however, cannot help but live as well in a world that is beyond the sensory, where experience is given through more than just the senses, it appears that in the West, knowledge of the entire spiritual world must be completely yielded to the private belief of an individual, and that this belief must develop free of any scientific influence. People do not allow the content of religion to be affected by scientific research. Spencer, in his way, expands the scientific method of thinking to sociology and then stops there. We see that in the West there is supposed to be a strict distinction between science, 
which is required to be based completely on natural science, and the human being, for whom spiritual content now has no connection to science. Let us now move forward from Herbert Spencer to the points we are confronted with in the case of Hegel. It does not matter that in the second third of the 19th century, Hegel, who belonged to the first third, was considered superseded by the philosophers of Central Europe, because Hegel represents in a most significant way the characteristics of Central Europe. Let us look at Hegel. Hegel's emotional disposition speaks of a certain aversion against the Western, universalistic, scientific manner of dealing with a worldview, as in the case of Spencer. This worldview, however, was prepared by Hegel's predecessors, the naturalists, as well as the philosophers. We can see, for example, that Hegel could not stand Newton. He had no sympathy for the purely mechanical way Newton viewed the universe. Hegel rejected not only Newton's color theory, but also his entire interpretation of the cosmos. Hegel invested a great deal in returning to Kepler's laws of planetary motion. He analyzed these laws and came to the conclusion that Newton did not add anything new to them, but that the entire law of gravity is presented already in Kepler's theory. Hegel adopted Kepler's theory because he saw that in Kepler's work it is more or less the spiritual experience which gives birth to scientific thinking that is comprehensive. Kepler was trying to explain the externally scientific on the basis of the spiritual. To Hegel, Kepler was simply the person who was able to penetrate the spirit with thinking and to build a bridge between what was scientifically recognized and what, according to the Western world, could only be believed. Hegel saw Kepler as a person who was capable of elevating science to the level that in the view of the West was reserved only for faith. This is the reason why Hegel, like Goethe, rejected Newton's color theory. We see in Hegel's disposition a certain antipathy against everything that seems completely natural from the perspective of Newton's disposition. At the same time, Hegel had the real capacity to live exclusively within the realm of thought. What Goethe said to Schiller was absolutely self-evident to Hegel, that he, quote, sees his ideas with his eyes, close quote. This statement may seem to show some naivete, but sometimes, if we see it correctly, this kind of naivete turns out to be the most profound philosophical wisdom. Because Hegel's life was entirely within the realm of thought, he would have simply not understood how people can insist that the idea of a triangle cannot be comprehended. To him a higher world of revelation, a world of higher spirituality, exists for us only because it is reflected in the shadows of a plain filled with thoughts. From above the spiritual world throws its shadow images upon the plane of the human soul, where human thoughts develop. To Hegel, the concept of higher spirituality is based on the fact that the higher spiritual world is reflected in the human soul in the form of thoughts. Hegel tended to experience those thoughts as something spiritual. Therefore, he did not experience natural phenomena in their elementary presence either but saw them in the thought images reflected on the plane of the human soul. In this way it becomes impossible to separate knowledge from faith in Hegel's philosophy in the external manner described above, a manner that is absolutely natural for the Western world. It became Hegel's lifelong task to unite the sensory physical world with the spiritual world, parenthesis, which the West, because of its dispositions, wants to simply relegate to the area of faith. Close parenthesis. He wanted to combine the two worlds into one world that we can know about. In Hegel's case, knowledge was not opposed to faith. Here, however, 
the human soul is confronted with an important problem. How do we find the bridge between faith and knowledge, between nature and the spiritual, in our inner life? Hegel's tragedy was that he saw the problem which he was able to set forth in such a grand manner only in relation to the plane of thought. Although he was able to experience the inner power, the inner life of thinking, he did not perceive anything that was alive in its content. Let us look at the Hegelian logic. He wanted to go back to the old concept of Logos. He felt that if we want to have any real concept of Logos at all, then Logos must be something that is not simply thought, but that actively penetrates the world and fills it with life. To him, Logos is not simply an abstract logical content. To him, it becomes a real content of the world. However, if we consider Hegel's treatise, in quotes, logic, one of the three parts of his philosophy, we will see that it contains only abstract concepts. Hence, those who are really enthusiastic about Hegel's philosophy are strongly affected by the profoundly correct sense that one can comprehend the principle of creation in the world through the understanding of Logos. Logos must be, quote, God before the creation of the world, close quote, to put it in Hegel's own words. This is on the one hand. On the other hand, the question is how Hegel developed this concept of Logos. He began with being, then came to nothingness, to becoming, and to existence. He came to causality, to the purpose, to teleology. We look at the concepts of Hegel's logic and we ask if this could have been the content of the divine before the beginning of creation. It is abstract logic, furthering creativity. Logos as a postulate, but a postulate of purely human thought. One can almost feel the tragedy in this. One can also feel the tragedy in the fact that Hegel's philosophy counts as being overcome. However, it contains elements that can give birth to something new. It contains seeds. Hegel saw in this philosophy his salvation, being, nothingness, becoming, existence. But today, when people learn about Hegel, they say this is outdated. We do not have to deal with it. However, if we decide to experience this concept in a more internal way, through a process of the soul, in the way Hegel wanted to experience it, then all concepts of empiricism and rationalism disappear, and the thought can be experienced, and the experience can be directly thought. Then the thought becomes experience, and the experience pure thought. Those who are willing to do this feel the desire to free thinking from abstraction. They see Hegel's logic as the key to a transformation of thought that could turn into something very different if it could express itself more directly. Hegel's thought appears to me as the seed of a plant that does not show what it will become, although it contains a multitude of possibilities. It seems to me that when this seed grows, when the human being grows it with care and plants it in spiritual soil using anthroposophic research, then the seed will show precisely that thought not only exists in thinking but also can be experienced as reality. Here we see that Hegel was a Central European. Moving to the East, we see in Vladimir Soloviev a man whose vocation unlike any other philosophers, is to become more and more part of our philosophical search. We see someone who becomes gradually more important as we let his unique ideas influence us. At the same time, we see in Soloviev a representative of an Eastern European way of thinking, which, however, is not the Asian or the Oriental way. Soloviev has adopted everything that is European, but has developed it further in a particularly Eastern variant. What do we see in his philosophy with regard to the human desire for scientific knowledge? 
we see that Soloviev disdains the kind of thinking that the West appreciates most, particularly in the case of Herbert Spencer. To Soloviev, this kind of thinking really points to the truth and the knowledge he is looking for. In contrast, Soloviev offers a real experience in the realm of the spiritual. In his philosophy, this experience is not accompanied by full consciousness, but appears rather in the unconscious as atavism, albeit in the spiritual realm. It is more or less the attempt to experience knowingly, but almost as if in a dream, what the West shifts, also consciously, to the realm of faith. Thus in the East we are confronted with things that could be experienced in an undefined way. Something that appears as another form of experiencing Hegel's idea of building a bridge between natural existence and the realm of the spiritual. At first, those with a central European spiritual background feel uncomfortable exploring Soloviev's philosophy on a deeper level. He recommends something that reminds them of a foggy mysticism, of an excessive life of the human soul, of something that cannot be formulated in terms of the external world, but can be experienced only internally. Those people feel the completely undefined character of the mystical experience. They also find that Soloviev uses the same concepts and expressions as Hegel, Hume, Mill, even some that recall Spencer. But he uses them only as illustrations. Therefore we can say that Soloviev certainly does not get stuck in the foggy mysticism. Rather, the way he treats religion as science, looks for it everywhere, and develops it as philosophy, allows us to compare and analyze his teachings in terms of Western concepts. Currently we are confronted with the following situation. In the West, we see the effort to develop a worldview based on natural science, that is, the effort to place natural science on one side and the spiritual on the other. We struggle with the problem of finding a bridge between the two sides, with the help of Hegel's unclear phrases, such as, quote, nature is spirit in its otherness, close quote, or, quote, spirit is the concept when it has returned to itself, close quote. In these confusing phrases, we see Hegel's tragedy of being able to experience everything he was searching for, but only by entertaining abstract thoughts. In the East, however, we see how Soloviev has preserved the way in which the Church Fathers must have discussed philosophy before the Council of Nicaea. He completely transports us back to the first three centuries after Christ in the Western world. Thus, in the East, we can see an experience of the spiritual world that is not yet capable of elevating itself to its own conceptual definitions. It needs Western concepts to express itself, even though in its system these concepts remain unclear, imposed, and alien. We can see how the philosophical understanding of the world has developed in three different ways. Looking at this threefold way in which the philosophical understanding of the world is developed, out of the very character and predispositions of the West, the East, and Central Europe, we realize that now, when science is extending its influence uniformly in every area of human society, it is our task to find something else that goes beyond these three philosophical streams. The three streams are based generally on elements that formerly made philosophy a personal human affair. Today we see that the West, Middle Europe, and the East follow their love of wisdom in different ways. We understand that in ancient times philosophy could have been still an inner condition of the soul. In our times, however, when people are so individualized, the love of wisdom is manifested in many different ways. Perhaps this is precisely the reason for us to realize what our own task is, and particularly what the task is of those who are in the middle, between East and West, where the problem appears in its most tragic and most intense form, even if today it does not yet concern all philosophical souls equally. 
If I had to present this issue visually, I would say the following. From a philosophical point of view, the voice of Soloviev is like that of the old priest who lives in the higher worlds and has to develop certain abilities in order to live in those higher worlds. In Soloviev's work we hear everywhere the language of the priest transformed into philosophy. In the West, the voice of Herbert Spencer is like that of a man of the world who wants to adjust to the practicalities of life. He wants to give science a structure that can produce a practical foundation of life, as Darwin does with his theory. In the middle, we have neither the secular man nor the priest. Fichte, Schelling and Hegel are not priests like Soloviev. In the middle, we have the teacher, the pedagogue of the people. He is there even where German philosophy is based on religious contemplation. There the minister has become a teacher. Even Hegel's philosophy has the character of teaching. In modern days, for example, in Oswald Kulpa, or Kulpa, we see how we have lost philosophy, which now is nothing but a summary of the ideas presented in the individual sciences. When it comes to non-organic science, we ask ourselves what sort of concepts it brings forth. When it comes to organic science, we ask ourselves the same question. What sort of concepts does it bring forth? The same applies to history, religion, and so forth. We collect those concepts and construct with them, completely superficially, an abstract unity. What I am trying to say is that the subject of the theory in the different sciences should be one common theory. Considering the sensitivity of the people, this is generally the point that science in Central Europe should reach. If, however, we reflect, we see that because we are influenced by thinking like that of Herbert Spencer, we are obligated to stick to unconditional belief in natural science, to the belief in our ability to experience through observation, experiment, and our reflecting reason even belief in reason that can elevate itself above observation and experiment. However, we deceive ourselves if we think that there is no problem in transferring the concepts we have gained in such a manner to the higher level of the social organism. In trying to comprehend the social organism with the help of the same concepts we have derived from natural existence, we overlook the fact that the social organism does not have the most important characteristic of the natural organism, the sensorium. We see that the strong leaning toward natural science forces people, such as Newton, to hold on to only the mechanical and to try to satisfy their spiritual needs outside the realm of science. As we know, Newton tried to explain the apocalypse, but from the perspective of mysticism. Hence, along with his scientifically established worldview, he was searching for something mystical as well. Let us look at natural science as it appeared in the 19th century and as it was gradually adopted by Central Europe. Here, science was established according to the model of Western scientific thinking, without our noticing the entire worldview developed on the basis of the Western model. People went mad when someone once tried to defend Goethe's ideas of physics as contrasted with those of Newton. What about the development of biology? Goethe established a kind of organic science that required the experience of concepts by means of mathematical thinking. Our time urgently presses for us to develop a science of biology that suits modern thought better than the one we have inherited from previous times. In its further progress during the 19th century, however, Central Europe did not accept Goethe's biology, but that of Darwin, a science full of concepts that relate to those of Goethe as the concepts of the 16th century to those of the 18th. Concepts kept developing only in Central Europe. The West was satisfied with concepts that were sufficient only for the understanding of nature. This is why certain concepts simply do not exist in the West and why they disappeared when Central Europe adopted Western thought. 
For example, Central Europe lacks the idea of the living thought, as we see it in Hegel. The concept of comprehending reality separately from the empirical. This idea was lost, because the way of thinking in Central Europe was flooded with Western thought. Therefore, here in Central Europe, we have the task to observe exactly what a naturalistic way of thinking really is. People dislike the anthroposophist who is attracted to this naturalistic way of thinking as much as they dislike the naturalist. I would never say anything against the way of thinking in natural science. Anybody who believes I would is mistaken. However, I must see the kind of thought in natural science in its pure form and then I must try to characterize it in its pure form. If we confront natural science without prejudice, and if we accept the conclusions of Western studies without imposing any philosophical interpretations, what science or Western scholars describe, such as what is described so ingeniously by Haeckel, would appear somewhere, excuse me, would appear everywhere not as solutions, not as answers, but only as questions. To the unbiased thinker, all of natural science becomes gradually a great universal question rather than an answer to our questions. In everything, one can feel how the best scholarship on natural science, including the atomic theory, which I do not reject but want only to place correctly, turns into one big question which speaks to us with the voice of the West. What are the origins of this question? We will not discover the complete reality if we look only at the external world and focus simply on the perception of the empirical. We are born into the world as human beings and cannot change the way we are designed. We take into our inner self a part of reality to build our views based on it. Then we turn to the external world, to the sensory empirical, and we fail to integrate into our views that part of reality that lives in ourselves. Only through human struggling can we connect the inner half of reality to the part that looks back at us from the outside world. In the West we see one half of reality, studied with particular dedication. That half, however, produces only questions, because it is not complete. On one side we see ourselves confronted with one half of reality, the empirical, and we look carefully, and if we look carefully, it leads us to a question. Central Europe realized the character of questioning in Western thought and tried to get through to thought itself. This is what the philosophy of Hegel did. The East grasped what is beyond thought and what affects thought, but it was not able to fully awaken it and to give its body skeletal structure. In his philosophy, Soloviev was able to develop flesh, muscles, and even blood, but it lacked a skeleton. Therefore he adopted concepts from Hegel, Hume and others and gave a foreign skeleton to what he himself had created. What we experience in our spirit can be transformed only when we no longer need a foreign support system. Soloviev's spiritual experience, however, exists like a shadow because it cannot produce its own skeletal structure and thus cannot become apparent. If we are not satisfied with only an external skeletal system, but want to live in spirituality and to develop through hard spiritual work, then we should build a skeletal structure for our spiritual experience and develop the concepts for it. The exercises I mention in my study, Knowledge of Higher Worlds, Initiation, published in title and outline of Esoteric Science and others, would be appropriate for that purpose. They can help you develop an inner organism of conceptions. This would be the other side of reality, the side that germinates in the Eastern philosophy of Soloviev. Central Europe has always had the challenge of building a bridge between nature and spirit. We have to deal with another important historical problem as well, how to build a bridge between the West and the East. This is the task we have in contemporary philosophy, and it leads inevitably 
to anthroposophy. If anthroposophy is able to give substance to its own experience of thought, then it can also allow for experiencing natural reality in a fully materialistic way as it is experienced in the West. In that case, the bridge between pure faith and knowledge, between cognition and subjective certainty, would be built with fully engaged scientific effort and not with abstract concepts. Then philosophy will develop into real anthroposophy and science would be able to stimulate philosophy at any time. Hegel's philosophy could be brought back to life only if it is rejuvenated by the bloodstream of spirituality introduced through anthroposophy. Then its logic will not be too abstract to be, quote, the spirit beyond nature, close quote, as Hegel wanted it to be. Rather, it will replace the abstract with the living spirit of philosophy. All this gave anthroposophy the primary task to explore the following. How can we build a bridge between what we now call truth, which must include the full reality, and what we call science, which also must include the full reality? in accordance with our modern standpoint now, many years after the time of Hegel. Briefly, this problem had to be articulated, and it is the most important philosophical problem of anthroposophy. Quote, what is the relationship between truth and reality? Close quote. In my introduction later today, I would like to place this problem at the top of my list with the observations that will follow next. The end of Lecture 3. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in London, which are the sole uh, creators of the English translations of Rudolf Steiner's work and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider them in your patronizing. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies, uh, Seven Lectures and a Report, uh, Collected Works, Volume 81, translated by Judith Wormuth Atkinson. This is Lecture 4 entitled Anthroposophy and Education, given in Berlin on March 8, 1922. Most honored participants. Many repeatedly object to the anthroposophic worldview, stating that it requires people first to study and to develop particular abilities as a basis for accepting its ideas, and that consequently from the very beginning the results of anthroposophic research cannot be tested by everyone. In spite of this, it is claimed anthroposophy still proclaims its views to all those who are unprepared. No matter how plausible this objection may sound, it belongs to the most unjustified objections that could ever be made against the anthroposophic movement. The goal of anthroposophy is not to turn everyone immediately into a scholar in the area of the supersensory. Its goal is to present the results of its study in a way that could be tested by all, simply by using common sense and healthy logic. This does not eliminate the need to put some effort into taking at least some initial steps toward suprasensory studies, for which there are instructions in various publications I have already mentioned here. Simply because of the circumstances in our contemporary civilization, everyone could become an anthroposophic scholar to a certain degree, but that is not necessary in order to prove the results of anthroposophic studies. They could be proven simply by using common sense. One of the areas where such a test could be made practically is the area of pedagogy. For a long time, very long time, the anthroposophic worldview existed only in the sense that it presented ideas when people asked about the supersensory. This was before contemporary cultural circumstances made it possible for anthroposophy to intervene in practical life. Anthroposophy is very well suited to helping in practical ways. 
but even this only became possible in a very limited area and to a very small degree when Emil Molt opened the Waldorf School in Stuttgart, whose administration I am in charge of. The short article titled The Education of the Child from the Perspective of Spiritual Science shows that already in 1907, before the founding of the school, there was an impulse to shape a school according to educational principles based on anthroposophic understanding. However, only after founding the Walter School did it become possible to turn these principles into practice and to apply the pedagogical and didactic aspects of anthroposophy. I will not be able to mention more than a few ideas in the context of these introductory remarks, but I think that these ideas can be developed further in the rest of the lectures today. When using our common sense, we verify for ourselves the things we perceive through anthroposophic ideas. We see that these are not simply theoretical views or abstract ideas, which we hold to satisfy some need for theoretical knowledge. What is expressed in ideas that have an anthroposophic source is real human power, something that concerns the entire human being, something that makes love stronger and that could be transformed into a driving force for the human being. Although the usual scientific ideas and thoughts related exclusively to the sensory world are expressed in the fact that they serve theoretical and practical interests related exclusively to the sensory world, to repeat myself, ideas based on anthroposophic studies affect the whole human being. This includes the way we grow stronger, our capability to live, and our understanding of life. Such an understanding of life enables us to react to all possible situations by using our will. If we enrich any given aspect of life through the ideas of anthroposophy, and we let these ideas guide us, we will see that our actions gain more strength and become more effective. This power and effectiveness gain validity particularly in the area of pedagogy and didactics. When the Walter School was established, we had no opportunity to choose the external conditions for the education and the process of teaching those children who were entrusted to us. Today, people usually make the point that if we want to have satisfactory work in the classroom and a satisfactory education, we must have an appropriate place for the school or the educational institution. Certainly there are many arguments supporting these assertions, and to a certain extent they are also confirmed in practice. Having an ideal space, however, was not possible for us. In the beginning we had to start the experiment with the children from the Waldorf Astoria cigarette factory, accepting the existing circumstances. This means that we had to work with a very particular kind of children, and we had to begin our teaching in a building that, of course, was not at all appropriate, since it used to be a tavern. In other words, we were not able to rely on anything but on the pedagogical and didactic aspects that could be established on a purely spiritual basis alone. We should always emphasize that anthroposophy does not aim merely at an abstract knowledge of the head, but for an understanding of the world and its secrets. Such an understanding involves the entire human being, and it can lead to a kind of knowledge and understanding of the human being that cannot be achieved in any theoretical field. Ultimately, education and teaching are based on an understanding of the human being, as this is demonstrated in the relationship between the teacher, who is the educator, and the one who changes, who is the growing human being, the child. Therefore, our Waldorf pedagogical system is established on the immediate basis of anthropogenesis, the child. I will mention only one detail that can demonstrate how real understanding of the whole human being can prove itself in practice. 
Today we have a kind of psychology, more or less accepted by the acknowledged sciences. However, this psychology theorizes around certain questions that remain always without satisfactory answers. For example, psychology asks what the relationship is between the psychic spiritual and the bodily physical in the human. And psychology comes up with all sorts of theories. We have three types of theories. The first type tries to begin with the psychic spiritual and aims primarily at defining it somehow. Then theorists create some abstract concept of the psychic spiritual and begin to study to what extent the psychic spiritual affects the bodily physical. Another, more materialistically colored theory assumes that the bodily physical is the foundation and that this bodily physical creates the psychic spiritual only as a secondary function. A third theory represents the psychic physical parallelism. Its purpose is to give validity to both the psychic spiritual and the bodily physical and also simply to observe how the functions of the one occur parallel to the functions of the other without elaborating on any inner connection between the two. All these are psychological speculations. They gain some substance only in living practice where through psychology, through the knowledge of the psyche, we find the driving forces of pedagogy and didactics. In this area, the attitude toward the psychic spiritual in the human is simply not yet as advanced as the attitude toward the principles in natural science, which we are used to seeing as self-evident. In science we can observe how somewhere there is heat, even though it was not produced in the usual way. We can imagine how this heat was first in a different condition, in the so-called condition of latent heat, and how out of this latent condition the heat became obvious. These principles, which are so common in science, should also be accepted, metamorphosed in an appropriate way, of course, in the observation of the complete human being, which includes the psychic spiritual. Even if some of us do not yet understand this at the moment, we will still come to such an attitude, which will be completely validated by science, if we look at the first major metamorphosis that occurs in the human organization, the change of teeth around the seventh year of the child's life. Such changes are usually observed only superficially in the human being. But the change of teeth is something that deeply affects an entire life. If we train our ability to view things in this way, we will learn to recognize that with the change of teeth, the entire psychic life of the child becomes different. We will also realize that before the change of teeth, children actually do not live, in quotes, in themselves. And I have in mind the real meaning of this phrase. Instead, children are completely dissolved in their surroundings. We will recognize the fact that the most important thing about the forces in the child's organism before the change of teeth is imitation. Children learn how to move through imitation. Unbiased observation will show exactly how the movements and gestures of the father and mother and of other people surrounding children are transferred into their very organism. We can observe that under normal circumstances children also learn how to speak under the influence of imitation. We can see how their psyche dissolves in its surroundings, in the real meaning of this word. This, however, will not be the case during the process of the change of teeth. At that time, we will see how the forces that develop in children bring their capacity to produce independent mental images. This ability to produce independent images, which to a certain extent frees children internally from their surroundings, does not exist before the seventh year. Along with the change of teeth, the child develops some inwardness and becomes more capable of abstract thinking. 
At the same time, the nature of childhood determines the fact that children perceive everything from the inner life of the people who surround them. Thus, we have to assume that in the second phase of life, which begins with the change of the first teeth and continues until sexual maturity, the child develops internally by adjusting to the adult environment. What is impressed on the child at this stage is not what the people do or anything that the child imitates. Rather, it is what lives in other people and what is expressed through words, the way people think and their inclinations. All this is impressed on the child no longer through imitation, but through the inner force of authority to which the child has the same predisposition as to growth or to nourishment. I hope that you will not misunderstand what I mean here by quote, the force of authority, close quote. As the one who wrote title The Philosophy of Freedom, I would like merely to point out here that the principle of authority plays a role in a particular phase of human life. Therefore, it is not necessary to form the entire process of education around what we currently call the principle of authority. If we pay enough attention to such an observation, things begin to differentiate themselves more and more clearly, and we become more and more capable of observing of observing the metamorphosis in the developing child, not only from year to year, but also by the month. So, what is it then that happens when a child between the change that what happens with a child between the change of the first teeth and sexual maturity? Those who have an eye EYE for the facts realize that between the ages of seven and fourteen, and these are only the approximate ages, forces that earlier were hidden begin to find their expression in the child's psyche. In the first few years, these forces are hidden below, in the physical body, and they affect the formation of the human organism, including that of the brain. In fact, they affect the entire development of the physical. Thus we can say that the spiritual human, the soul, which in the first seven years is latent in the physical organism, but is expressed in each single movement, in each process of the body, is freed only later, in the same way in which warmth could be hidden in a body and be freed only under particular circumstances. After the seventh year, the physical is left more or less to itself. Consequently, the spiritual in us, the soul, does not grow completely out of the physical, but it does so to a very high degree. The change of teeth is then some kind of an ending point in the first stage of development in which the spiritual in the human being, the soul, was in a way overlapping with the bodily physical. You can see that looking at things from such a perspective enables us to recognize the real connection between spiritual or soul matters and the bodily physical. At this point one ceases to theorize about the question of how exactly these two aspects influence each other. Rather, at the first stage of life we simply see the spiritual or the soul entirely within the body, as the development of children shows clearly. And then, later, when the soul becomes free, we see it in its own form. Thus, we do not start with comparison between pre-formulated, abstract concepts. Instead, we observe the work of the spiritual or the soul within the body at the different stages in life. This approach, however, puts an emphasis on the fact that the same phenomena usually studied in natural science as if they are accessible only for the external senses, could be studied from a spiritual perspective as well. Anthroposophy as spiritual science is simply a productive continuation of natural science. At least that is the case when the natural scientific way of thinking is rightfully established. If we do not want to get stuck in superficial definitions, 
And if we want to analyze in detail the question of what exactly anthroposophy wants, then this becomes clear. If we gain deep human knowledge of the world of concepts and ideas through spiritual science, then any accusation that the world of ideas is alien to life is obviously refuted. In the area of pedagogy, anthroposophy does not wish to oppose in any way the pedagogical principles defined by the great educational theorists, especially during the 19th century. Anthroposophy recognizes that there are major and meaningful pedagogical principles, and it appreciates great educators as much as any, everyone else. Nevertheless, I should say, that even though we have all those great pedagogical principles, currently people do not feel satisfied with educational practice, a fact demonstrated by the existence of diverse educational methods. Why is that so? Often this is simply a consequence of the intellectualism characteristic of our time. This intellectualism causes more animosity toward life than we could possibly imagine particularly toward the social areas of existence. In the world of ideas, intellectualism creates only abstractions. The abstract, however, has no life force. Abstractions are the corpse of the spiritual, to a degree, and are experienced as such. We may have the best principles that inspire us passionately, but as long as they remain abstract, they cannot have a really productive influence on life. Only when these principles are penetrated by a real and living spirituality that is connected to the essence of the human being can these principles become practical. Thus, anthroposophy does not wish to establish new abstract principles of education. It wishes only to provide guidance in pedagogical and didactic skills in the implementation of the art of education and teaching. It wishes to offer what even the best educational principles have not yet offered, a spiritual foundation for practical implementation, for the inner abilities of the teachers to work in school and in education. For the very same reason, contrary to what is often believed, the Waldorf School is not organized in a way that enables us to stuff children's minds with our views of the world as we present them to adults. I must emphasize that even religious education is left to the Catholic priests for Catholic children and to the Protestant ministers for Protestant children. We have simply added another class, a non-denominational religion class, for the children of non-religious parents. Without this class, these children would not have had any religious education. In this way, we can achieve some awakening of religious feelings because exactly those parents who would not have sent their children to any class on religion are sending them now. We put forth a lot of effort not to preach anthroposophy in this class, but to build up what is appropriate to be fostered in children of that age. In other words, it is not about forcing anthroposophy into children's minds but about helping teachers to adjust, through anthroposophy, their methods in a way that corresponds to a true education of developing human beings. We see, therefore, that through practical methods it is possible to establish education and a way of teaching that focus not only on the child but also on the whole development of the human being. After all, it would be silly to think that the feet or the hands of a, a child has now in childhood are already completely developed. It would be silly to try to force the hands and feet as they grow to remain the same as they were in childhood. Obviously, we consider the physical organism of a child to be something that is in a state of becoming and that later in life will become something different. However, we do not always treat the spiritual development or the soul in the same way. On the contrary, often we see that children are being taught stern concepts. 
And we think that in their psyche, certain things gain sharp contours at a very early age. This is wrong. Everything that we want a child's organism to become eventually, we need to approach now, but only in a way that will allow it to grow, to keep changing. Later, say, when the students are 30, they will not only remember what they learned when they were young, but as physical growth has transformed their limbs, they will also have the capacity to transform everything they learned. Along with everything spiritual that we offer a child, we must offer something that has the power to grow and to transform itself. This means that we have to make teaching more and more alive. All this can certainly be expressed as an abstract principle, but it can be achieved practically only in the presence of a really intimate knowledge of the human being. Such knowledge enables us to figure out from the nature of the child everything that we usually call the lesson plan or educational goals. Therefore, the Waldorf School has teaching plans and goals that are based on a real knowledge of the human being. These plans can be redesigned from month to month in accordance with the nature of the children themselves. We are trying to design education in a living spirit. I should mention one thing further. We can see great improvement now even in public education. Nevertheless, we all know that in the course of an academic year a child suffers more than we realize under the system that evaluates the child's progress. On the one hand, we have the achievements of the child and on the other hand, the evaluations of these achievements by the teacher. Evaluations are expressed in the following way, satisfactory, almost satisfactory, almost non-satisfactory, less than satisfactory, and so forth. I have to admit that I was never able to see the difference between almost satisfactory and almost non-satisfactory and other formulations like this. To us who teach in the Waldorf School, It is important that at the end of the school year children receive certificates recording their individual characteristics and the experience of the teacher with each particular child. The child sees a kind of mirror image of herself or himself. Experience has demonstrated that this mirror image, which does not specify satisfactory, less than satisfactory and so forth for each subject, is accepted with a certain satisfaction and joy, even when there is criticism in it. This means that children receive potent evaluations based specifically on their own nature, from which come the ability to learn and which can serve as guidance throughout the following year. If one has the necessary love to go deeply into the living nature of teaching, one can design living methods, even under the most unfavorable circumstances. In this way, we can overcome precisely those abstract pedagogical principles that must be overcome in our times. One can find hardly any indications in external historical sources of the way the human being has changed during the succeeding epochs of humanity's development. Those who are sufficiently unbiased, however, can understand that the spiritual expression of the soul in the 10th, 11th, or 12th centuries must have had a character very different from that of the state of the soul in the civilized world since the mid-15th century. Intellectualism has been developing in our civilization until it reached a culminating point in the 20th century. However, like the principle of imitation or the principle of authority, intellectualism has the peculiar quality that it has transformed from a latent into a free form at a later age. We can see that people are able to progress from their basic nature to the intellectual nature only after they are beyond the age of sexual maturity or even later. Before that, use of the intellect paralyzes and almost kills the work of the psyche. 
Thus we can realize that we live in times that support only the adult, times that have as a cultural impulse a quality that can be manifested only in the adult human being. As a consequence, we no longer understand the world of childhood and youth because we are steeped in everything that gives the tone for the culture of our adult world. This is the most important thing to consider in our civilization. We should be very clear about the fact that the same forces that have allowed our science and technology to flourish and triumph also deprive us of the possibility of understanding our children and of analyzing in depth the full nature of childhood. Now we need to find the way to rebuild the bridge to the young person and to the child. No matter how we see the different forms of youth movements today, they are profoundly justified. They are the cry of the youth. Quote, you adults have created a civilization that we simply do not understand when we live in our primal nature. Close quote. The bridge between adults and children must be rebuilt, and anthroposophy wants to offer its contribution. If we move from a general cultural viewpoint down to the details, we will see that an educational plan based on the essence of childhood itself reveals to us exactly how the plan should unfold at the different stages of the child's development. Writing and reading used to be something different from what they are now. Look at our modern letters. They are abstract, out of touch with real life. Let us look back at earlier times. In pictographic writing, we find something that is directly based on life. Today, we do not even think about how intimately connected to life this kind of writing was and how alien to our modern life writing and reading are today. Yes, we are in the midst of a civilization where it is natural to put things alien to life in the service of civilization. If you look without prejudice at a stenographer or an elderly person sitting behind a typewriter, you would see that such an occupation brings life estrangement into civilization. Simply articulating this fact, does not make us enemies of culture or reactionaries. We are not denying the advantages of such means for modern times. There are advantages. At the same time, we should develop counter forces that could help us heal the things that can only bring culture to a decline, to decadence, if we simply let them affect us without paying attention to the consequences. Real healing can come only from education, from teaching and learning in the classroom, a process that must be constantly redesigned in the light of the complexity of upbringing. When a child enrolls in the primary school, the intellect is still in a latent state. The capacity for abstract thinking, which must first be awakened, develops later. This is why we cannot approach a child immediately with abstract forms of writing and reading. Since there is a creative, spiritual principle at work in children in a greater and more perfect way than there is in any art form, we can work only with things that allow us to approach the child in a dynamic way. This creative principle works subconsciously. Thus, we have to support the subconscious and try to find special forms appropriate for the age of the children that will introduce them to writing through art and thus will allow them to employ their full human capacity. Then they can take the next step toward reading. If children who are eight or nine years old are not yet able to read and write, teachers should have the courage to say, quote, Thank God that they cannot yet read and write. Close quote. The point is not that children should be able to do certain things at an early age, but that they learn in an appropriate way and at the appropriate age. This is why teaching in the Walder School is designed with art as the basis for every subject. This artistic pedagogical approach is the beginning, followed by a gradual intellectual development. 
We also take into account that music should be integrated into the classwork as early as possible, since it is related directly to establishing the will. To the classes of traditional gymnastics, also for will development, we have added eurythmy, an art of movement that combines the physical and the spiritual. We develop our methods as we go along to improve the pedagogical approach. However, we can see that this art of movement, which captures both the human spirit and soul, conveys something meaningful. We see that in these required classes, children adapt to the art of movement in the same way in which they adapt to language at a very young age, naturally and with joy. Educational development based on art allows children to experience colors as well from very early on. Even though painting with watercolors can sometimes be inconvenient, for instance if we have to spend more time than usual cleaning up, we still see that such a method gives children a much deeper sense of life. We are doing more than simply helping them to, in quotes, get by. This approach requires them to interact with the external world. They develop a sensitivity toward the beautiful, toward everything that makes sense in nature and in human life. This is much more important than teaching children specific details from a subject matter. In addition to what I can describe here, which are only general guidelines, I must mention the anthroposophic basis of the teacher's outlook. When teachers enter the classroom, close the door, and step in front of the children, they bring along pedagogical, in quotes, imponderables, formed by their way of looking at the world and the human being. Teachers who use their living senses when they observe how children adapt to the surrounding world by imitation rather than abstract ideas, will know how the soul or the spiritual aspect works inside the child. They get to know the children and their knowledge forms judgments different from the usual. When we look at life in such a way, we learn certain things. I would like to give you an example. Once the parents of a child came to me and told me that, to their surprise, their young son, who had been a very good boy so far, stole something. I asked, how old is the child? The parents said, five. Quote, I said, then we should try to figure out what the child really did. It is possible that he did not steal at all. Close quote. What did the child do? The boy took some money from a drawer, the same drawer the mother took money from every morning when she was going to shop. With the money he took out of the drawer, the boy bought some sweets, which he did not even eat himself, but offered to other children. In this case, we have to say this is not stealing whatsoever. The child had seen what his mother was doing every morning and felt entitled to do the same. He simply imitated his mother. Only after the change of teeth can we observe a change in the child's attitude toward the norms of adults that are expressed as good and bad. Therefore, we have to establish a completely different area of judgment, and we have to learn that everything we do in the presence of a child has to be done in a way that the child may imitate. Children should be able to imitate everything they see including the imponderables of our thoughts. This is how the reality of thoughts is expressed. Not only what we do is important, but also the way we think. In the presence of a child, we should not simply yield to the first thought that comes to mind, because thoughts affect the child. We have to consider our thoughts carefully, even if they are only in the form of imponderables. If we observe how a child deals with the surrounding world before the age of seven, we can see the reflection of how the child must have been before coming down to the physical or sensory world as a human being. Until then, as anthroposophic research shows, human beings are completely surrounded by the spiritual world, which is connected to them in the universe as the body is connected to the physical world. This is why in a child younger than seven we can see the continuation of life before birth or even before conception. 
This understanding must be transformed into a pedagogical sense, so that when standing in front of the child, the teacher can think. The spiritual world has entrusted me with a being that I have to understand, and it is my task to pave the way for this being's life path. In a way, teaching and educating a child becomes a selfless service to the entire world. Through teaching and education, we sculpt something out of a particular system of views that have power and without which there is no real teaching and no real education. The most important things in the pedagogical and didactic activities are precisely these views, which are based on an anthroposophic understanding of the world. While this understanding is not externally accepted as the norm, it is nevertheless rooted in deep internal work. Such an attitude causes us to look at the secrets of the child's body cautiously, in religious awe. We see how something created in the eternal primordial depth of the world reveals itself step by step in the movements and the gestures of the child. We realize that we must solve a riddle of life in a practical manner. Only in this way are we going to give the right direction to our entire attitude toward education and teaching. Anthroposophy wants most of all to see that this atmosphere which radiates from all school activities is present in the process of teaching and that it dominates every detail in this process. However, in order for this atmosphere to be predominant, it is first necessary that through a deep inner conviction we come to see how the spirit works its way down to the finest detail of each sign of life the child shows. In order to take up and approach a class with the attitude and the skills that are based on internalizing the anthroposophic worldview, a teacher must come to particular understandings and develop the resulting abilities, and these should become instinct. I have been able to make only a few suggestions, which I will expand in the following lectures. The suggestions I made were intended to show that anthroposophy does not want to be radically against the major achievements in the area of pedagogy. Anthroposophy wants to offer some assistance, which would help bring these otherwise abstract theories into real life, into our daily practice, so that the art of education becomes a living impulse an effective factor in our social life. The end of Lecture 4 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in London, who are the sole translators of Steiner's work into English and have also given me permission to do these recordings, please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies, Science, Philosophy, Education, Social Science, Theology, Theory of Language. Seven lectures and a report given in March of 1922, translated by Judith Wormuth Atkinson, And it is Collected Works, Volume 81. This is Lecture 5, entitled Anthroposophy and Social Science, given in Berlin on March 9, 1922. Most honored participants, in my introductory words today, even more than at the other meetings, I will have to restrict myself to making only a few suggestions. There will be a detailed discussion of our economy in the upcoming lectures, and the main substance of what needs to be said about the social sciences will have to wait until then. We cannot speak of social science if we take only one theory as a starting point. Today, and I mean our immediate present, the present moment, we can speak of social science only if we see it against the background of the desperate situation concerning the economy of the civilized world. I tried to describe part of this desperate situation in my book 
titled Core Points of the Social Question, also known as Toward Social Renewal, after the end of the catastrophic World War. This work was based on an observation about developments in social science that concerning, excuse me, that considering current conditions should have been apparent to all. Our present economy is deeply intertwined with something very basic for the entire scope of social conditions, what we could call the social question. In our times, most people do not think it possible to separate the discussion of social conditions from the question of our economy. Yet my book aimed at the clarification of this issue. The book aspired to demonstrate that within the social organism, the economy must have its own independent position, a position determined exclusively by economic principles, economic views and impulses. Seen from such a perspective, my book might seem to display an inner contradiction. I am saying this here in a very straightforward way because a lot depends on understanding this. The book was not supposed to be a theoretical work on social science, however. It was intended to inspire most of all the practitioners, those who work in a practical and direct way in business, production, distribution, and all areas of economic life. The book was written out of an understanding that came from observing the economy of Europe for decades. Since the book was intended to be thoroughly realistic and to prompt practical activity, it also had to contain a contradiction. This is nothing but the same contradiction characteristic of our entire society. I am talking about the fact that the chaotic messy elements of our social life could actually be productive, but only if each element develops naturally under its own conditions and in its own particular section of society. In my book I discussed the threefold formation of the social organism, a formation that would lead to a completely independent organization of the economy almost completely separate from the government, the law, and the spiritual life. The economy would be determined by those who are part of it and by the way they deal with their own impulses. However, we live at a time when this is not yet the case. The economy is still interwoven, too enmeshed with these other elements in the structure of the social organism. We live at a time when the contradiction is reality. This is why my study, which was written on the basis of reality and was intended to make suggestions for this same reality, implied some contradiction. Nevertheless, the study had to be aimed, first of all, at achieving some clarity, at the clarification of the circumstances. And so, making this introduction today, I am in a peculiar position because people in the widest possible circles generally misunderstood the conclusions I made. My conclusions were based on anthroposophic methods of thinking, as well as on decades of realistic observation of the conditions in the European economy. I can only say that I see very well why my original intentions were misunderstood. Misunderstandings themselves are a phenomenon of our time. Nevertheless, I am convinced that overcoming these misunderstandings is what we should aim to achieve in the field of sociology and in society. I would like to make some suggestions precisely in this respect because they could give us some direction. My book was first published just after the Treaty of Versailles, immediately following the terrible war catastrophe. Those were times when the currency relationships between Central and Eastern Europe were still very different. The impulses expressed in my book back then did not come, quote, out of nowhere, close quote. They were based on the situation in the world at the time, which led me to believe that perhaps there were other people who saw the same things I saw and were seeking change. If so, then it would have been possible, starting with Central Europe, 
to spread an economic impulse that could have brought certain progress in the midst of the clearly deteriorating economy and social life in general, which still has not recovered. Considering the complicated situation in the world, one would have thought that there would be no arguments against acceptance of the ideas in the book. These ideas were founded in the reality of the time. Nevertheless, they could be attacked. Perhaps they could have been formulated in a different way when they were first written down. But the point was not to create impractical, utopian ideas or to paint a picture of a future social organism. Rather, the point was to find people who understood that we were confronted with real, immediate problems in our daily lives, that we had to deal with those problems as best our professional knowledge allowed us, and while dealing concretely with the problems, try to find increasingly better understanding. Generally, however, what happened was something very different. On one hand, there were economic theorists who endlessly discussed what was written in my book and who attached all sorts of, quote, in quotes, demands to the things I had said. There were also theorists who misunderstood what I had said in a very idealistic way and who kept asking how this or that could happen. There are no instant answers to such questions. Only the passage of time reveals the answers. In addition, there was also something that really surprised me. The practitioners of economics, that is the hands-on business people, the entrepreneurs, those who had direct experience in specific areas of economic activity and who knew what works in their area of business and what does not, precisely those people paid no attention to their own knowledge and experience. They allowed themselves to be influenced by theorists, who had no direct experience with their particular branch of the economy. When the practitioners discussed the core points of the social questions, their conclusions showed that they themselves had become the most abstract theoreticians. It became obvious that they could be conventional business people in the old sense easily enough, but they did not understand the new circumstances. These practitioners were absolutely unable to discuss the economic problems that I am talking about from any other perspective than the one of abstract theory. It could cause real despair to stand in front of business people trying to have a discussion with them. Some were absolutely not able to look at anything concretely, but instead kept repeating only the most trivial and general points of economic theory. Along with the repetition of theory originally, those who were very thorough practitioners refused to talk about the possibility of looking at the economic problems in the new way that I suggested in the book. I encountered yet another problem with socialists. Despite the vague interest that my book aroused among them, they did not want to look at their goals from this perspective. They made judgments about everything on the basis of whether or not it fit the old Socialist Party clichés. This is how we came to the terrible currency disaster that prompted me to make those remarks. It should now be understood and evaluated in a way different from the way we now understand it. When I first published my title Appeal to the German People and Culture, and then titled Toward Social Renewal, readers aside, those are both available on the website as recordings, and of readers aside. There were people who had very serious intentions regarding the process of healing the Central European economy. They said, quote, Yes, uh, such suggestions, they called my theories suggestions, uh, are very good, but we have to figure out, first of all, how to improve the state of the currency. Close quote. This was said at a time when the miserable situation of the currency was still a paradise compared to the present circumstances. Such statements demonstrate that all we want is to play around with the external symptoms. There is very little understanding that the current situation is a superficial symptom manifesting unhealthy economic conditions 
and that such a treatment of symptoms does not even begin to touch the real evil. These statements also show that there is little understanding of the need to go deeper into analysis of the present socio-economic conditions. If we want to discuss the problems mentioned in Toward Social Renewal, in any realistic way. This is how I came to my appeal, which I expressed at the end of that book and at the end of many lectures. We must come to our senses before it is too late. To a certain degree, it is already too late, since we are no longer able to approach the issue in the original spirit of toward social renewal. Meanwhile, the chaos in our economic life has grown so much more complex that we need many more additional explanations of what, in my view, not only should be stated, but also must be stated. If we want to discuss what damages our economy, we will not be able to avoid examining a general characteristic of our time. When I looked at a newspaper yesterday, I noticed an article Here we can see the most important symptoms in simple sentences formulated by some of our contemporaries. Quote, postponing of Lloyd George's resignation until the end of the conference in Genoa. Close quote. This title expresses the entire situation of our time. The main characteristic of our time is to wait. We want to wait. This is the common principle today, to wait until something happens. We cannot say what will happen, but we want to wait until it happens. This attitude has penetrated our souls, and one can see it in all possible areas. Now, I would like to mention something that is apparently abstract, but only apparently. It is actually realistic, because it points out the forces that are active among us, which gradually, through the centuries, have given credibility to this optimistic principle called, we want to wait. Looking back at the development of past cultures, we see that ancient scientific thinking should not be called simply scientific. You have heard me talk about this in the lecture I gave recently at the Philharmonic Hall. If we look at the thinking that was there, we realize that economic circumstances did not grow immediately out of ancient scientific thought. Originally, economic life developed almost instinctively because of trade, more or less independently of human thought. What people did in their economy was born naturally from their daily life. People acted intuitively. Some areas of trade were certainly expanded, but everything happened more or less intuitively. We might raise some objections against the economic conditions of the ancient times, on the basis of modern views of freedom, dignity, and so forth. Nevertheless, it could be helpful to see some remarkable signs of humanity's development, which could teach us a lot even today. To give only one example, I will point out the relationships between employer and employee, if I may use these modern terms with regard to ancient times, in ancient Greece, Egypt, and Asia. Considering how we feel today, these relationships may raise harsh criticism, but any such criticism would be unhistorical. We have to admit that the labor relationships in each particular period of time were based on the sensibility of the people who lived at the time. This is the first thing that we should keep in mind. The other thing that we should keep in mind is the drastic changes in humanity's development that we observe in the 15th century and which affected the entire state of the soul of people in the civilized world. I have emphasized frequently that external history does not tell us much about how the human soul changed its view of life at the time. So, if we ask ourselves how this part of human development relates to the economy, the answer is the intuitive control of the economy of the sort I just described expanded until the 15th century, an epoch of drastic changes. Along with those changes, the state of the human soul was affected by intellectualism, by the desire to understand the world through reason and logic alone. 
This desire, which became a profound necessity of the human soul, affirmed itself brilliantly in natural science. Technology developed gloriously out of natural science and celebrated an extraordinary triumph which cannot be appreciated enough. Yet this intellectualism has proven to be completely unable to aid us in understanding the social context of development in human life and human beings themselves. Many debates have demonstrated this, including those during this course. Through such intellectual orientation of the soul, we have discovered the laws of the outer nature of the senses. However, intellectualism will not help us comprehend the complex circumstances of social life that penetrate and are entangled with each other and organize themselves as they became, become entangled and materialize as they become organized. The system of intellectual ideas is too loose for the phenomena of social life. From intellectualism, humanity certainly learned how to think scientifically. This kind of thinking covers every subject area, even theology. If we observe it carefully and experiment with it, we will see that intellectualism rules over our entire scientific way of thinking. We consider everything that is not based on intellectualism as simply unscientific. The time of intellectualism overlapped with the transition from a purely instinctive economy to an economy that had to be brought to life by human thought. Thus we could say that at the time when people did not think intellectually about the world, in economic life was led in an instinctive way. Along with the trend toward a world economy and world trade, people began to think of their economic life in an exclusively intellectual way. One can see two sides or polarities in economic theory as it developed, in mercantilism and in physiocratism, in Adam Smith's ideas of national economy and in the entire development of political economy up to Karl Marx. On the one hand, economic life itself required that economic decisions should no longer be made intuitively, but that they should rather be based on reason instead. On the other hand, since thoughts could be based only on intellectualism, economic decisions become more and more one-sided. As a consequence, there is nothing that came out of economic theory that we could see as applicable in economic practice. On the one hand, we had the theorists of political economy, such as Ricardo, Adam Smith, and John Stuart Mill, who produced axioms out of intellectualistic postulates. On the basis of these axioms, they built confusing, self-contained systems that were like vicious circles. On the other hand, at the same time, we had economic practice, which might have required a symbiosis with the spiritual, but never found access to it. Economic practice continued to develop, however, within the old, almost instinctive life, and thus fell into absolute chaos. These two movements became more and more commonplace in modern times. On the other hand, there were the political economists who had no influence on economic practice. On the other hand, there were the practitioners who continued the traditional practices which threw the economies of the civilized world into chaos. We certainly need to articulate things like this in a very radical way to point out what reality is, what does work, and what should be seen as the real problem. If we are looking now for some connection, for a synthesis between economic thought, which, however, has been meanwhile completely destroyed by the practice, and the practice itself, we can find this connection in only one area. Most recently, a kind of scientific economic realism has developed, which acknowledges that we can never come to a general... To to general economic laws that will always apply. Instead, we should take into consideration economic circumstances as they develop in particular nations or among specific groups of people. We can find guidelines with regard to trade, 
only if we look at the specifics of external and concrete economic circumstances as they happen. This is the foundation of what appeared as so-called social or economic legislation. We began to believe that we can analyze the factual economic circumstances in connection with the social conditions that bring them about and then legislate economic guidelines. In other words, we have tried to bring about through the government some of the things we observe in a rather roundabout way. But, excuse me, by doing so, however, we have in fact admitted that real economic laws cannot come out of such observations. Yes, basically this is the situation in which we still find ourselves today. We can see how we are stuck in this situation precisely now when we are able to have groundbreaking experiences, or shall I say, when we are able to evaluate social phenomena in the right way. You all know that Woodrow Wilson came up with his so-called 14 points, exactly at a time when our society fell into such terrible chaos. What were these 14 points really about? Basically, they were nothing but the abstract principles of a man who knew little of the real world, a fact demonstrated at Versailles where he could have actually played an excellent role. A man who was estranged from reality and inspired by intellectualism wanted to show the world how to organize itself. I can only wish that we had been welcomed with such enthusiasm as civilized humanity welcomed those 14 points. However, a large part of the Central European population fell for Wilson's theory even though only for a little while, and made us the exception. In 1917, there were people in Central Europe who were interested in these issues and who asked to speak to me. I did not pursue these people. They either came to me or were brought to me. I tried to show that the latest social developments were abstract and estranged from reality. I tried to show that everything negative which we considered to be based on bad educational principles, but that we nevertheless see predominating everywhere, could be summarized in the person of this teacher of the world, Woodrow Wilson. I also showed how people welcomed with enthusiasm the abstract principles of this, in the pejorative sense, world teacher. In addition, I tried to show that a recovery from the current circumstances could be achieved only if, in contrast to all these abstract views, we stand firmly on the ground, on a ground that does not exclude thought, but that nurtures the kind of thought grown out of reality. In this case, we would not create any utopia, and I would like to say that Woodrow Wilson's principles were pure utopia, utopia multiplied by three. In contrast, we should understand clearly that actual impulses are to be found only in the real circumstances of contemporary humanity. Thus, in all my arguments, I was avoiding any utopian theory. I avoided even mentioning how capital and labor are formed. I gave only a few examples of how we could possibly imagine their developing from the current circumstances into the near future. I have said all this, however, only to illustrate what capital and labor should be. In fact, capital, capacities, could change either in the way I mentioned in my book Toward Social Renewal or in some other modified way. I did not mean to paint some abstract picture of the future. My goal was to explain what the basis for a real solution of the so-called social question could be, not to propose an abstract theoretical solution, I did not intend to, quote, define a solution, close quote, in general for the social question, because I have enough experience to know that it is impossible to do that. In the 1880s, in cozy Vienna, I used to spend at least an hour nearly every afternoon with all sorts of bright people. Within this hour every afternoon, the social question was solved several times. Those who see the present without bias can realize that the current solutions published frequently on the pages of thick volumes are not much better than the solutions negotiated with a few strokes of the pen 
and the many fanatical words spoken over cafe tables back then in Vienna. Defining a solution was certainly not my goal, and to accuse me of such an intention was a most terrible misunderstanding. All I wanted to show was that the solution to the social question could come about only in a natural way, that it could not be the result of discussions, but only of action. However, the conditions for such action must first be prepared. In my toward social renewal and in other debates, I was referring to precisely these conditions. I was trying to demonstrate that in our social organism we need institutions that would allow the natural development of spiritual life, a development affected only by the conditions and requirements of spiritual life itself. I argued further that we will need a second entity where only the judicial impulses of the governments would be at work, and then a third entity dealing with the economic impulses based on the production and consumption of goods. If this economic entity were to develop out of an associative economic system, it would culminate, in my view, in a healthy pricing policy. By developing an associative economic system, we would not revive the old class system. This is not about dividing people into teacher, class, soldier, class, and worker class. The human being of modern times has progressed to the status of an individual and cannot be placed into any particular class in a theoretical way. However, simply because of the forces of historical development, the existing institutions tend not to treat the spiritual life, the judicial life of the state, and the economy separately from each other, each on the basis of their own conditions. Only after we create the conditions that would allow the economist, for example, to make changes in the current market or capital relationships on the basis of purely economic impulses, only then, when such possibilities are created, would we be able to develop what we could call a real solution of the social question. This solution, however, would be in a constant state of becoming. So, my goal is not to solve social problems, because such a solution, in my view, can never be final at any given moment. Once the social problem has appeared, it remains in constant flux. The social organism is like someone who is young and will age. The social organism must be constantly instilled with new impulses, and we will never be able to define it in a fixed form. The government can have a real democratic foundation only if it has a healthy organism in which people consider the individual conditions of each specific area of life in its own right. This will not be accomplished by those who sit in parliaments mixing all possible interests, where those interested in the economy make decisions about spiritual issues, or those representing the state make decisions about the economy, and so forth. What needs to be said in a healthy organism will not be said by only one person in such a mixed parliament. Rather, it will result from constant and continuous negotiations between the different parts of the social organism. In that sense, my book was a warning that we need to stop the futile discussion of the social question. Instead, we have to stand firm on the ground and deal with social problems on a daily basis. My book was an appeal to those who understand that need to turn abstract theory into thoughtful and real action. Economic associations should be responsible for these actions in the economic area. Such associations are profoundly different from the processes of nationalization that occurred in recent times, and they could be established at any moment on the basis of existing economic conditions. Such associations should consist of the practitioners, the people who are really connected by the processes of production, circulation, and consumption of goods, things that really connect all people. These are the people who should organize themselves in associations to establish a healthy pricing policy. In the present situation, we are a long way from benefiting from the practical and professional experience that the people organized in these associations would bring 
to a healthy pricing policy. Such a policy would not be the result of legislation and discussion, but of experience. Nevertheless, people felt the need to discuss the main ideas that I presented in my book and which I presented in my introductory words to you today. The world was so well trained in abstract thinking that it saw my suggestions only from the perspective of abstract thought. As a consequence, things are discussed for hours that I mentioned only as examples. And the point is missed to tackle the formation of the social organism on a daily basis in the way proposed in Toward Social Renewal. The point is not to search for theoretical solutions to the social question, but to determine under what conditions people will be living in society. Social life will exist when the social organism is working in the interest of all its three parts, in the same way that the natural organism works precisely toward unity, though it is also divided into three parts, relatively speaking. Nowadays we have to explain what we mean when we say such things, you see. Even when we have expressed them, there is still an expectation that the words we must use will be taken according to the theoretical meaning attached to them. People immediately translate into intellectualism ideas that obviously are not the product of intellectualism. For example, in my book I speak about capital and about the basic principles of the production process and about labor in such a way that the ideas can be related to life. If we begin abstract discussions, we spend a lot of time on definitions. One would say rightfully that capital is crystallized or accumulated labor, while another would, one would say also rightfully that capital is saved labor. We could do this with any concept of political economy if we want to remain within the mind frame of intellectualism. These, however, are not concepts that we can deal with in theory only. On the contrary, we should try to understand how concepts are being formed and how they live. The practitioners who cling to traditional practice while talking abstract theories could instead do something new. I would like to clarify this through a comparison. Ernst Müller is short and has clearly youthful features and childlike qualities. I see this man 20 years later and I say, quote, This is not Ernst Müller, close quote. Although he is still short and has childlike qualities, the face is completely different. If 20 years ago I have created an image of Ernst Müller and I want it to be identical with the real person I am facing now, I will be making a terrible mistake. No matter how much people are opposed to believing it, this is exactly what they are doing when they think about the economy. They think about capital and labor, and they create their respective fixed concepts in the belief that these concepts will always be valid. In this case, however, we do not need to wait for 20 years. We could simply go from one employer to another, from one country to another, to discover that the concept we have created in one place has no validity in the other, unless it has been transformed of its own accord, like the person Ernst Müller. We will never be able to recognize what we are looking at unless we have flexible concepts that are fully rooted in life itself. In our time of scarcity, Anthroposophic principles make it possible for economic institutions to find their own expression because anthroposophy by its nature deals with the ever-changing spirit using ever-changing ideas. We can learn from anthroposophy how to infuse our ideas with the force of growth, with an inner flexibility, and how to use such ideas regardless of the disbelief of today's practitioners. We can use flexible thinking in the reality of the social life between individuals, between countries, and throughout the entire world economy, which has now become necessary, although it has been destroyed in such an artificial way. Thus we could say that the attempt to come not to social ideas but to social impulses by means of anthroposophy was not based on anything external. I remember the times when these terms were much discussed. I always had to repeat 
social impulse. This made people terribly angry. According to them, I should have used the phrase social ideas or social thought because people had in mind only thoughts. It was terribly upsetting to speak of impulses. He did not realize that I needed the word impulse because I was working with the reality and not with abstractions. Consequently, today we have to establish new conceptions of the so-called social problem. Circumstances are now very different from those in 1919. Things are changing very fast, especially in the area of economics. It is necessary to keep seeing movement, even in those ideas that were already considered to be flexible in 1919, and also to preserve the perspective of common sense. Those who are able to see the reality of economic conditions know that these conditions have changed significantly since I wrote toward social renewal and that we cannot simply deduce the same conclusions we did back then. Nevertheless, they will find in that book at least an attempt to search for methods of social thinking in a realistic way. That attempt was founded on the constant search for reality, to prevent us from falling into the trap of illusions and mysticism. That attempt was nourished by the quest for exact truthfulness, which is characteristic of the anthroposophic view of the world. The end of Lecture 5 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, uh, SteinerBooks.org and RudolfSteinerPress.com in London. Uh, SteinerBooks.org is in America that are the two places that translate Steiner into English for us and give me permission to do the books. Please consider patronizing them directly. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies. It is lecture six of seven lectures and a report, Collected Works Volume 81, translated by Judith Wormuth Atkinson. And this is lecture six again, entitled Anthroposophy and Theology, given in Berlin on March 10, 1922. Most honored participants, I am compelled to refer to a note in a journal that was handed to me just now, a note in Die Christliche Welt, The Christian World. I did not expect to be referring to this in my introductory words today, since I did not know of it. The note in the journal reads as follows, quote, Between the 5th and the 12th of March, there is an anthroposophic college course. Friday, the 10th, is the Day of the Theologians. The lecture on Friday is an obvious challenge to theologians by Steiner and his followers. Close quote. And so forth. Well, most honored participants, the lecture today may be anything but a challenge. If that is the general belief, it is a profound misunderstanding. This lecture is certainly not a challenge to theologians. I did not initiate these lectures, and I have never been involved in them in any other way except that I was asked whether I wanted to participate in this college course by giving lectures and making some introductory remarks. I am least involved with today's lecture in the sense that it was not my decision to include this particular topic in the college course. And it never crossed my mind that what we will be discussing here today could be interpreted as, quote, an obvious challenge to contemporary theologians, close quote. Therefore, dear participants, in order to avoid any further misunderstandings, repeated or new, of the few introductory words that I will say today, I will admit myself, I will limit myself to the topic, the relationship between anthroposophy and theology so that there are no further misunderstandings. I will give up some of the points I was going to make because I do not wish to see my intentions misinterpreted again. Distinguished participants, I apologize if because of this challenge which was aimed at me, I am forced to include some brief personal remarks in my introduction today. I have never desired, and it was never my intention, to challenge theology in any way. Since the very beginning of our work on anthroposophy, insofar as this is about the field I am involved with, 
we have never tried to argue with modern theology as such. Nevertheless, this argument has happened, even though I have tried to prevent it. It has happened simply because anthroposophy has been frequently attacked by the theologians, and because some people, not so much I myself, but others have tried to defend it. I would like to say that as a field of study, anthroposophy is intended to remain completely neutral toward theology. Its purpose is to work in the spirit of contemporary science. Toward the end of the last century, science took a particular direction. It used particular scientific methods, which led to particular scientific views. For the same reasons I already mentioned, as well as because of lack of time, I cannot go into detail about these views and these methods. Growing out of the entire historical development of modern times, they have been applied most particularly to the study of natural science, where they led to the greatest possible triumphs in human progress and human wel- and, and welfare. I do not mean this in a trivial, but in a very profound sense. At that time, I would say philosophy was somewhat at a loss with respect to the study of natural science. Philosophy was confronted with methods which were applied primarily in natural science and which were virtually inapplicable in philosophy, a field dealing with completely different subject matter. In terms of theory and in terms of theory of knowledge, we were not sure in what sense we were supposed to use scientific methods in the area of philosophy. As a consequence, experimental psychology was trapped in an area where things were more or less apparent or more or less right, but where uncertainty remained present. By contrast, on the basis of different developments, anthroposophy established its own methods. On one hand, it takes account of things achieved precisely through the newest way of thinking and the newest scientific research methods. On the other hand, it takes account of the human desire for a spiritual world and its understanding. We were confronted with the fact that we must fully accept scientific methods. Regarding our attitude to the area of science, I am still as much a follower of Haeckel as I was in the 1890s, as I already have mentioned. I do not mean that scientific methods should not develop further, or that what Haeckel wrote about should not be criticized precisely from the point of view of science, but this is a completely different issue. With regard to my attitude toward the purely natural world, I am as much a follower of Haeckel today as I was back then. The question is what we actually experience through the scientific methods of observation and through the fact that we are trained in scientific precision and attitudes. In other words, what ideas and concepts can we form when we simply need to work with natural science? There is one thing that remains true for all methods of observation. Because of insufficient time, I cannot prove this here, but if the statement that, quote, nothing is in the mind that is not first in the senses, close quote, is true for external observation through the senses, then Leibniz's addition to that statement, quote, nothing, except the mind itself, close quote, is also true. There is something much more than experiencing only the sensory in experiencing the mind. In other words, in the movements of the soul throughout the categories of the mind, in experiencing ideas that help us study an object and the facts in nature and that allow us to formulate natural laws, in experiencing the world of ideas. Thus what scientists, excuse me, thus when scientists are facing natural science and they are really unbiased, they must admit that the senses must be the source of everything that is in the mind, but the senses cannot be the source of the mind itself. Once we have fully comprehended this, nothing will prevent us from observing what we see internally and from further developing the categories of the mind through an inner psychic and spiritual process, through a process that represents internally something similar to the external processes of growth in a plant or an animal. We will be truthful 
to the natural process of becoming. If we try looking at the human mind itself as if it were an embryo that could grow internally. From this effort we can learn the truth that the sensory world is not the source of the mind. If we really try this, then the rest will be an immediate consequence of the growing intellect that develops into imagination, inspiration and intuition. A process I was describing here during these few days and also in other places. This is simply a matter of the further progress in the inner development of the human being. This attitude amounts to a real view of the world. Anthroposophy is trying as much as possible to put this view into words. I admit that sometimes we are certainly forced to use unsatisfactory words for what we observe, simply because in the past few centuries our language, like all modern languages, has adapted to the external materialistic understanding of the world. And we have adjusted our feelings related to the words more or less to that same understanding. This is why we always struggle with words when we try to express in language things we observe through imagination, inspiration or intuition. This is especially the case when we try to express these observations in words in order to prove them using our healthy human common sense, which is another goal of anthroposophic study. In that sense, anthroposophy has always been a field of study, and this is exactly the way in which I understand it. To those who had a desire to hear what we could learn about the suprasensory world through such methods, and in the beginning there was a very small circle of such people, we will show what we can discover in this way. People are not forced to join this movement by any means. They join only by their own free will. The rumors that some hypnotic means were used are slander, in some cases a conscious and in other cases an unconscious slandering of the real intentions of the anthroposophic movement. It seems that those who, because of their healthy common sense, contemplate things studied through imagination, inspiration and intuition are freer than most people in our times. For example, people of our times run after the movements of their political parties and allow others to influence them in all possible ways. Anthroposophy must free the human being from precisely these inner psychological dependencies. Those who enter into the spirit of anthroposophy are not simply liberated from the most common passive way of thinking. They also make their thinking internally flexible and more powerful. Thus they become free individuals through this internally empowered thinking. For reasons that I do not wish to discuss today, Originally, very few scientists joined anthroposophy, even though the movement counted precisely on them. Today we are beginning to have more scientists in our circles. To those more or less naive souls with strong psychological needs, who joined the anthroposophic movement in the beginning, we have always talked about the discoveries made in a conscientious way within the framework of anthroposophic studies. I have been glad to hear some of the things that people tell me, such as one of the highly respected persons present here today. It is amazing that you get such a large number of listeners since you avoid speaking in what people call a popular or commonly comprehensible way. In fact, you speak in a way that always requires that people do some inner work while they are listening, and this is something people usually do not want to do. Thus, I must wonder how you get such a large number of listeners. Close quote on that. These approximately were the words I heard long ago from a person who is present here today and who back then visited a series of my lectures. While I always wanted to promote anthroposophy in the world, I have never looked for popularity. It is remarkable that people from all walks of life and from all denominations came to us. While, through its work, anthroposophy did establish some kind of relationship to the contemporary religious movements, originally there was never a conflict with the religious needs of the people who joined us, people from all walks of life, as I mentioned. 
Catholics who are in our circles have often asked me if it is possible to participate in the anthroposophic movement but to remain Catholic with regard to religious practice. I said to them, of course it is possible to participate as a good Catholic in the things that anthroposophy offers because anthroposophy is not supposed to limit itself to one single confession but simply to speak on the basis of the study of the suprasensory world. It would suit me best to tell people what we have found in the suprasensory world and not to participate in any polemic. Those who tell honestly what they have seen know well how it comes to polemics and how unproductive it actually is. My original desire was simply to tell what could be discovered through anthroposophy and to pay no attention to polemics. These things, however, do not always work out as we wish. Nevertheless, within the anthroposophic movement, there were people from all religions, including Catholics, and I said that Catholics can participate in the anthroposophic movement like anyone else. They might be in conflict with their religious practice regarding only one issue, the confession. Not because this is about confession. Confession itself could be considered simply a matter of conscience, I have seen many Protestant clergymen who long for some kind of a confession in order to establish a more intimate relationship to their congregations. There could be different opinions about that. The issue is that the Catholic Church denies communion to those who have not first made a confession. Because of this prohibition against participating in the most important sacrament of the Catholic Church, it is very difficult for Catholics to combine the beliefs they have established through their experiences in the suprasensory world with a behavior that does not allow them to feel free, but that the constitution of the Roman Catholic Church forces them to follow. The way confession is treated tears Catholics apart from the free observation of the suprasensory world, not because of anthroposophy, but because of the constitution of the Roman Catholic Church. Catholics could avoid this if they could avoid the confession. However, they cannot avoid the confession because if they did, they would not be able to partake in the communion. This is the difficulty Catholics are confronted with. Despite that, there are many Catholics who are trying to satisfy their spiritual needs in the anthroposophic movement. It was only natural that people from all denominations joined the anthroposophic movement. It was only natural that our very time brought the need to discuss questions of Christianity in the anthroposophic association. I would like to say the following in that regard. As far as the subject of Christology includes questions concerning the sensory and the suprasensory in this world, Anthroposophy treats the essence of Christology in the same way as any other subject. It tries to explore and to give answers about the essence of Christology through the methods of its suprasensory studies. It is difficult to summarize in a few words the character of the relationship of Anthroposophy to Christology. However, I would like to note the following. We see human beings primarily here in their earthly life, between birth and death, and we realize that their existence, including their psychic and spiritual life, has the form of a physical body. We also realize that they are bound to this physical body when it comes to their views, to processing the phenomena in their environment, to their work or the exercise of their will, and generally to the way they function in the physical sensory world. Thinking back on what we see in our surroundings when we wake up in the morning, we realize that we first perceive these surroundings through the senses of the body and through the mind, which combines the experiences of the senses with our perceptions of everything that surrounds us in the physical world. Provided that sometimes we are able to look away from the environment and reflect sufficiently on ourselves we cannot deny the fact that the mind or the intellect, which bears in itself the primordial, 
the intrinsically spiritual, is able to put things together on its own. This process of putting things together culminates in an idea that has now a spiritual content, a content that represents the divine or the father idea, if I may phrase it this way. At this point we could involve anthroposophic methods of study. I can describe this only very briefly. Anthroposophy gradually makes the entire process of obtaining human knowledge transparent. This is something that is evident from the content of these lectures too. Its purpose is to point to the processes that occur within the human being when we try to look away from the external world in order to see what we ourselves have done and to ask ourselves what have we actually done? What gives us the right, the capacity, to put together the external world into ideas? As we analyze the complexities of this process sufficiently, we come to the Divine Father experience, if I may use this phrase again. Those who understand the process of arriving at the Father experience in anthroposophic terms make a very particular judgment. Please do not misinterpret this judgment, which is a fact I must express in a radical way. We make the judgment that only a completely healthy individual, someone whose physical body is completely healthy, can have this father experience. This means that those who cannot have that experience must be carrying the traces of some degenerative problems, even if in a hidden way. In other words, anthroposophic study brings us to the conclusion that if we are not able to come to the Father experience, we must have some illness. This sounds radical, because the illness in question certainly cannot be discovered using the usual physical means. The illness is in the finest elements of the human organization, if I may put it this way. However, for those who can use anthroposophic methods of study, it is clear, atheism is disease. What I said yesterday about forming a judgment that may be right or wrong, healthy or sick, applies here particularly well. If we pursue only this path, we will come first only to the Divine Father experience. If, however, we continue on that path, And having come only to the Father experience, we realize the deficiencies of our soul. Or, if we become aware of the fact that basically by limiting ourselves to intellectualism, we as modern people, in a way limit ourselves to this Divine Father experience, then we will understand that we have to go beyond it. External observations could support us in this. It is remarkable that religion should be preserved in the Western world precisely where scientific views have reached the maximum of their intensity and where these views are not allowed to influence the area of the suprasensory. Precisely in the religious movements in the West, the spirit represented by the Old Testament intervenes and is particularly successful in our modern times. We can also see that even though the West accepts and preaches Christianity, it does so completely in the spirit of the Old Testament. We see that it molds Christ into the image of the Father and that it is not fully aware of the difference between the two. In the East, where the human soul does not make such a clear distinction between religion and science, where this bridge is treated more or less as a very basic internal experience of the soul, as we can see in the discourses of Vladimir Soloviev, there we see the Christ experience as an independent experience, even though it is immediately next to that of the Father. Thus we can see that those who are completely healthy cannot be atheists if they put together all the impressions of the external world and summarize them in the crowning experience of the idea of God to which they must add spiritual content. So at first they stay with the idea of the Father. With this idea, however, we cannot go beyond summarizing the external phenomena of nature. 
The idea fails immediately if we want to use it only to comprehend our own human development. Then we feel abandoned in a way. But if we analyze our own human development on a deeper level, from the level we reach when we internalize the outer world in our souls, and if we analyze the internal development without prejudice, then we will come to the Christ experience. At first this appears to be only an undefined inner experience. This experience clearly follows the principles of anthroposophy. We can understand the mystery of the historical event of Golgotha on our own, simply through honest observation of the development of humanity on earth. Through the internal forming of spiritual organs, the human being is led to imagination, inspiration and intuition. If we analyze human development from antiquity to the event of Golgotha, we will realize that there were traces of preparation for the coming of the Christ Spirit living in earlier religious ideas, not only in those of the Old Testament but in all religious ideas. Then, simply through contemplation, we can learn to recognize the fact that at the time of the event of Golgotha the Christ Spirit was not united with the earth. If we look at everything that people searched for in the mysteries at the time of the well-known pre-Christian religions, we will see how the ideas those people had of God eventually melded together into the Christ idea. We see how the human soul is elevated to the supra-terrestrial when people turn to their gods. We also see that in the beginning of human development, simply through the organization of the human being, people were given a great deal more than what their senses and their minds were able to perceive from the environment in their earthly existence. In antiquity, but less and less, so as time went by, the human soul possessed the ability for what I would like to call instinctive seeing a dreamlike seeing, the ability to contemplate the spiritual, non-terrestrial world to which the human felt attached. The human being experiences inner resurrection in the moment when through the mysteries or through popular religions the soul is elevated to things it can see as supra-terrestrial and with which in its deepest essence it feels united. If we analyze human development up to the mystery of Golgotha, we will realize that these inner abilities of the human were gradually diminished and no longer existed by the time the mystery of Golgotha happened on earth. Since development is not realized in sudden drastic changes, some traces of these abilities certainly remained. Some people retained, if not a precise seeing, perhaps at least an instinctive consciousness of what once was seen. We can find traces of this ability even in art. Then the mystery of Golgotha happened on earth. Anthroposophy sees in it how the spirit, which before could have been searched for only in the supraterrestrial, now flows into a human body. How Christ flows into the human body of Jesus. How exactly this occurred is a discussion we can have in detail only with those who are willing to study this subject scientifically. Anthroposophy shows that from the moment of the mystery of Golgotha on, a new era began, an era that all old religions mention Christ, uh, that all old religions mention, excuse me, Christ who went through the mystery of Golgotha, Christ whom Paul saw on the road to Damascus, this Christ remained on earth among human beings. This is the meaning of the words, quote, I am always with you until the end of time. Close quote. He lives among us. He can be found again. With some preparation, Paul's experience could be repeated again and again. However, if we take this road to Christ, who has been present on earth since the event of Golgotha, we will experience him through contemplation, by looking at our own inner development, 
We will find Christ through an inner experience, as we find the Father God through experiencing the outer world, unless we are sick with atheism. I can mention only briefly, in an outline, how through real study, anthroposophy arrives at the Christ phenomenon as an objective fact. Anthroposophy tries to present the Christ phenomenon in all its details as the most important fact in the earthly life of the human being, as something that has objectively occurred. Thus the entire spirit in which the Christ phenomenon is is presented in Anthroposophy supports its understanding as fact. Consequently, within the Anthroposophic movement, We have seen Jews who, in the most genuine, truthful, and honest sense, have accepted the mystery of Golgotha. Perhaps this way, my most honored participants, the anthroposophic movement anticipates something that should occur in the future development of humanity. That by pointing out what we can see in the mystery of Golgotha, we actually rediscover the path to Christianity. We have to ask ourselves whether the point Friedrich Nietzsche's friend Overbeck makes in his book that modern theology is no longer Christian may not have a very deep meaning after all. Should this question be justified even only to a degree, we would have the right to say that anthroposophy is capable of bringing people to the Christ experience in a very living way. At the time when the Christ phenomenon occurred, Many people had retained their ability to see instinctively. Thus they could see the foundation, or shall I say the spiritual substance, of the mystery of Golgotha, a substance that was recognized later in the first centuries of Christianity. After that, however, this phenomenon gradually diminishes. We see it diminishing. We see it was completely extinguished by the time of someone like Scotus Origina, We see that more and more medieval theology took root and tried to oppose the intended development of modern humanity's intellect, which, if left to itself and without inner development, could never reach the supra-sensory worlds. In a way, theology separated the human soul from its natural development impulse and divided it between the world of the things humans can gain knowledge of through intellect and the world of the unknown, which cannot be reached except through revelation. We could understand the entirety of medieval theology on the basis of this background, especially the Thomistic theology that Catholicism considers the only authoritative one. Today this could be discussed. The goal of anthroposophy was and still is nothing else but to express in a simple way what the various possibilities for a spiritual worldview are. And in the same way in which anthroposophy comes to the statement that atheism is actually a hidden disease, it also comes to a second statement. Not to find Christ, not to find any connection to Christ, is fatal. It is a fatal misfortune because he can be found in an inner experience. He presents himself as the being who has gone through the mystery of Golgotha. One can come to the Christ experience on one's own. No one needs anthroposophic study to become a religious person in the sense of Christianity. However, if you come to Christ, you become part of the spiritual world. In that case, we can speak of a rebirth of the human being into the spiritual world of an extension of the essence of the soul through the experience of the spiritual world. We could also say that one who cannot find Christ is relatively limited in his view of the world. Atheism is a disease. Not to be able to come to Christ is a fatal misfortune. Not to come to the spirit is a limitation of the soul. For all those reasons, Anthroposophy deals only with religion, not with theology. And with religion we deal only with respect to the fact that people who have religious needs and cannot find satisfaction in the contemporary denominations turn to anthroposophy. 
Anthroposophy wants to deal only with what is needed in our times and what others do not deal with. As I have repeated many times, you can deduce what our fundamental attitude is from the following. Many years ago I gave a discourse on wisdom in the Bible in a southern German city. Back then it was a German city, today it is not. Two Catholic priests were present in the audience. After I gave my talk, they came to me and said, well, we didn't find anything in your discourse that could, that could be contradicted from a Catholic point of view. Close quote. I said, quote, if I could only be so lucky all the time. Close quote. They replied, yes, quote, but there was one thing we noticed. It is not what you say, but the way you present it, how you put it. And, and here we should say that we speak to people who are in a way prepared. You speak to a community who have a particular kind of education, and we speak to all people. Close quote. I told them, quote, Reverend Fathers, this is not about making decisions according to our subjective feelings, but about moving along with the time in our work. It is important not to imagine that we talk to all people, but to answer the question, what is the objective living development of humanity? I could be wrong imagining that I speak to all people, and so could you. It is very good to imagine this in order to have some enthusiasm. But my question is, does everyone who needs to hear something about Christ today come to you in the church? Close quote. The two could not say yes, since they knew well that plenty of people who search for a path to Christ do not go to church. Then I said, quote, You see, I speak to those who do not come to you in the church, but search for a path to Christ nevertheless. This means to set myself a task according to current developments, and not to imagine that I speak to all people. It also means to ask myself if there are people whose spiritual development makes them more open to particular ideas. Close quote. This is the only approach anthroposophy has ever had toward religious denominations. Even when we came to the point to be able to establish anthroposophy as the basis of our teaching practice in the Waldorf School, we still refrained from turning this school into a place where children's heads will be stuffed with anthroposophy. With regard to the study of religion, we have a Catholic priest who teaches the Catholic children and a Lutheran pastor who teaches Lutherans. We have also organized some sort of a class in free religion only for those children who come from dissident families, but that class is taught entirely in the spirit of Christianity as well. Nevertheless, in this class we do not present some kind of abstract anthroposophy nor a concrete anthroposophy as it is presented to adults. We put a lot of effort into presenting children with what is appropriate for their stage of development. Of course, first we have to search for the appropriate content and methods and to find them. Through the introduction of a class on free religion, we have brought back to Christianity those children who otherwise would not have had any religious education whatsoever. And they come to this kind of class on Christian religion in large numbers. We never used any kind of religious propaganda within the anthroposophic movement. And anthroposophy was not, in the least, established to oppose the different theological systems. The only thing incumbent on anthroposophy is to make the various theological systems understandable in their distinctions and not to fight them. This is how I have always seen my task when I have spoken to people who have come to anthroposophy, making clear why Catholicism has become Catholicism. Protestantism, Protestantism, Judaism, Judaism, and Buddhism, Buddhism. And how in all of them there is a certain kind of person who, through life, is able to experience in the soul the real Christ, an idea that I believe to be Christian. Consequently, if there had never been attacks that came from the other side, no argument between anthroposophy and theology would ever have been necessary. Even today I am saying all this only because it was the wish of those who organized this day of lectures on theology. The only task remaining for anthroposophy is the proclamation of the results of anthroposophic study of the suprasensory world. This is why I have always been reluctant to react to attacks, 
especially when they came from the theologians. Anthroposophy does not want to act as a fighter. It wants only to satisfy rightful human needs for spirituality as dictated by the times. Everyone who would like to cooperate with anthroposophy in this sense, to work toward the satisfaction of these rightful spiritual needs that surface from the depths of the human soul, everyone who wants to cooperate with it in this sense is welcome to anthroposophy. The end of Lecture 6 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, we have two publishing houses, rudolfsteinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in London, which are the sole providers of English translations for us of uh, Rudolf Steiner's work and have also given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies. This is the seventh and last lecture, and then there's one more reading of a report that he gave later to people about this conference. Uh, It is translated by Judith Wormuth Atkinson, Collected Works, Volume 81. This is Lecture 7, entitled Anthroposophy and Theory of Language, given in Berlin on March 11, 1922. Most honored participants, the organizers of this course requested that every morning I introduce the observations of a particular day with some comments. Today I shall open our work with a somewhat aphoristic discussion. I realize that precisely today this is not going to be easy. In a brief course addressing the same issues we will be discussing today, which I held once in Stuttgart in front of a smaller audience. It became very clear to me that one needs a great deal of time to talk about the controversial things that we will be talking about today. Thus I would like to say in advance a few words about the spirit of contemplation required by anthroposophy with regard to the view of human language. When we speak of language and are planning to discuss language from a scientific point of view, we should realize that it is more difficult to look at language as an object of scientific study than to discuss nature outside the human being, or even the physical nature of the human. In those cases we have at least one object that is clearly defined for our perception. Of course we could still argue to what extent perception is the basis of the object, or to what extent the object is grasped through the cognitive human capacity simply as the effect of an unknown cause. These, however, are discussions that occur only on the intellectual level. The object of scientific observation is a given and completed thing. This is not at all the case with language. When it comes to language, part of what develops while we speak exists already in the unconscious life of the human psyche. Certain things surface from these unconscious areas and are then combined with conscious elements which move as waves over an unconscious or subconscious stream. The momentary content present in our consciousness while we are speaking is only part of the real object with which we are generally concerned regarding language. Even if we cannot change contemporary speaking habits, we can still find a way to bring language as an object into our consciousness during the process of speaking. I would like to give you a humble example to illustrate this. Around Christmas I gave a series of lectures on pedagogical and didactic topics in the Gertianum in Dornach. The occasion was the visit of a number of teachers from England who wanted to come particularly to hear these, this series of lectures. When the word was spread that this series of lectures would be held, people from other Western and Central European countries, for example Switzerland, decided to come to the lectures too. Since I could not give the lectures in the big hall of the Gertianum, which has more than 900 seats, but only in a small room, I had to give each lecture twice, one after the other. 
Already before the lectures started, I thought that I should separate the English speakers from the rest of the audience. Certainly not, however, for any political reasons. I thought I should emphasize that the course was held in German, even for the English speakers, because I always speak in German when people want to hear something about anthroposophy, no matter where they are. I believe that this is a way to prove one's Germanness and that this is in service to the German spirit and the German language. In one of those lectures I talked about ethics and moral education, and I tried to describe how children can be brought to a level of inner experience that allows them to form ethical and moral attitudes. If I were speaking today in front of people who listen in the same way as some people were listening yesterday, then the things that I am saying out of having experienced them immediately would be called artificially constructed, as it happened yesterday when I was speaking about the Trinity. Dr. Rittelmeyer, however, gave a very apt response to that, using the comparison of a head and a book, a response I did not want to give you for obvious reasons. I did not want to give for obvious reasons. In the lecture on education, in ethics, I wanted to show how we should guide children by awakening their feelings of gratitude, interest in the world, love for the world, and love for their own actions. I also wanted to show how the feelings that we perceive as duty develop out of this love for our own actions. Since we are talking about language today, I will mention that in relation to our immediate life, it was necessary to define a trinity with three words, gratitude, love, and duty. From the first two steps, gratitude and love, I came to the third, duty. I had to give this lecture twice, once from 10 to 11 o'clock for the English speakers, and again from 11 to 12 o'clock for the listeners from other nations, whose state of mind was essentially Central European. The second lecture could have been simply a repetition of the first, but in fact, because I tried to put myself into the shoes of the listeners, I had to speak to the English in a very different way from the way I spoke to the Germans. Something similar happened on the other days, but it was particularly necessary on this day that I have mentioned. Why was this the case? While in the hour between 11 and 12 I was speaking about duty to people whose sensibility as listeners was built on the basis of the German language, in the first hour, between 10 and 11, I was speaking to people who perceived what I was telling them about the duty impulse against the background of their concept of, in quotes, duty. There is a big difference between the feeling one has when one says the word Pflicht and when one says the word duty. In the hour between 11 and 12, I had to let the nuance of our experience that results from the use of the word Pflicht flow into my lecture. In German, when we say the word Pflicht, we awaken an impulse that arises in our psyche and leads the experience immediately to something else, which I could express by the verb Pflegen, or to the outpouring of a feeling directed from the action itself to its object. This is the essence of the impulse defined by the word Pflicht. The psyche has a very different experience when we define this impulse using the word duty. Although the word Pflicht refers to the psyche, the word duty refers to the intellect, to the spirit, to a principle that guides us internally, as our thoughts guide us when we move to action. We could say that Pflicht is something we do out of inner love and devotion. In contrast, we fulfill our duty because if we have human dignity, we want to be able to follow a law that penetrates us. We must be devoted to a law that we understand with the intellect. This, of course, is only an approximate description. My purpose is simply to emphasize that the complex inner experience is different depending on the use of different words, even though the dictionary tells us that the English word duty stands for the German word Pflicht. This fact applies to the entire national spirit, to the soul of the nation. 
and you can see that language reflects the nuances of the soul of a people. You will see in that sense that the soul of the Central Europeans is very different from the soul of the people from other nations, and that psychic life is expressed in language by the Central Europeans in a way very different from that of the English. Those who have no sense for the fact that the unconscious elements integrated in language are rooted on a much deeper level than the level of conscious experience will find no clear object for the scientific investigation of language. We have to be aware that when we observe nature, the objects of observation are external, or we create them neatly by some external actions. In this process, the objects remain still outside ourselves. Thus, we can definitely observe them. When we observe language, first we have to go through a conscious process of figuring out what is the real object of study that we observe. Consequently, when it is about language, we should observe more than what is in our consciousness. When we observe language, we should keep in mind the whole living being that expresses itself in the process of speaking and in language. We are rarely prepared for this scientific observation of language. For example, if we study the history of language or comparative linguistics, to prepare ourselves properly for the observation of a particular language, we would need to contemplate first its object, that is, the, in quotes, object of each language is its inner unconscious content, the unconscious substance of what is only partly expressed in the conscious process of speech. In addition, at the different stages of human development, the degree of consciousness related to language was different. For example, it was one thing at the time when Sanskrit originated, another when ancient Greek was formed, and again it is something different here in Germany or in England although the nuances here are becoming smaller and smaller and less visible. To mention only the rough distinctions, there are already major differences between the inner experience of a Briton and that of an American, both using the English language. Moreover, if one studies dialects, if, for example, one analyzes the different experiences people have when they use different German dialects, then one notices how many complicated psychic impulses flow into language expression and into the entire organism of language. It was a very good reason for why the Greeks felt essentially the same way when they spoke the word language and when they spoke the word reason, and why they combined these two concepts into one word. This was because the experience within the word and the experience within the thought, within the idea, were to a certain extent still indistinguishable and overlapping for the Greeks. While in our modern epoch there are distinctions in this respect. When ancient Greeks spoke, they felt that the thought was transformed into word. To them, the thought was the soul, and the word merely flowed into the thought like a body or shall we say, like the outer dress of the soul. Today, if we become conscious of this process, we may feel, when we pronounce a word on the one hand, as if the word floats away while we pronounce it, and on the other hand, as if the thought somehow swims on top of the stream of words. However, the thought is again clearly distinguishable from the stream of words. If we return now to Sanskrit, we will first need to go through some real psychological processes and experience certain soul phenomena to be in a position to internalize the feeling one must have had when saying a word at the time Sanskrit originated. We definitely should not look at Sanskrit with the same feelings towards speech and language with which we look at modern languages today. Let us take, for example, a very well-known word, manas. If you open the dictionary, you will find various translations of the word manas, spirit, reason, mind, and sometimes even anger or irritability. Generally, such translations do not bring us close to the inner feeling of the word that the people of ancient times once had. 
and could experience so clearly. At the time when Sanskrit was a language fully alive, the state of the human soul was different from our soul state now. In fact, it it was significantly different. It should be clear that as human beings have developed, there has been a deep transformation of the state of the soul. I have repeatedly characterized the major transformation that can be placed in the 15th century. However, as human development advances, there are always borderlines between the succeeding epochs. We can understand what was really happening at a particular time and what the experience of language was part of only if we can also analyze the inner psychological life of the human being at the time. At the time when the word manas was still perceived internally as something living, there was a phenomenon that I would like to call quote, experience of the meaning of sounds. Close quote. The inner experience was felt in an incredibly intense way through the sounds, which today we label as an M, an A, an N, and an S. When people pronounced vowels and consonants, the life of their soul was moving to a very high degree along with the processes within the organism, even if this was happening as if in a dream, because they were aware of that dream. If we are equipped with this understanding, and if we analyze how language lives within us, we will realize that the use of consonants reflects the attempt of human beings using their own inner but suppressed gestures to immerse the self in external processes in the physical world and to imitate the inner life of outer objects. Consonants are suppressed gestures, gestures that do not become visible, but that, nevertheless, include things we are able to experience in the rolling of the thunder, the flashing of the lightning, the blowing of the wind, and so forth. By experiencing consonants, we immerse ourselves in the external world. In fact, we want to repeat the life of external nature through gestures. We suppress the gesture, which transforms itself internally and appears in a metamorphosed form as a consonant. By contrast, we feel a certain amount of sympathy and antipathy when we are confronted with external nature. These sympathies and antipathies, which represent an inner experience, give birth to the entire, in quotes, vocalism, or system of vowels. Thus, as we live in language, we create a metamorphosed imitation of the external world through the use of consonants, but express our own inner relationship to the external world through the use of vowels. If we look in detail at the concrete language experience, we could certainly grasp and understand this even with the kind of life the psyche has today. When I use the word, in quotes, imagination, I do not mean some kind of fantasy, but the fact that the inner process of language experience could be really seen in ancient times. When the Sanskrit language originated, a dreamlike imagination was still alive in the human soul. At that time, people did not have images with sharp contours as we do today. They saw life in pictures, in images. However, these were not images like the ones discussed in anthroposophy today, images of which we are fully aware, images that are similar to our concepts with sharp contours. Instead, they were dreamlike, instinctive images that nevertheless had the effect of driving forces. One could say those images lived in the human being as living forces. People felt those forces as they felt hunger or thirst, but in a somewhat quieter way so to speak. In their minds, people were painting pictures, in a way. Of course, this is not the same way we paint pictures today. This kind of painting, however, was actualized in the use of vowels, applied as if they were paints applied to a canvas. Using vowels, people were immersing themselves in the element of the consonants, as if they were using the colors to highlight borderlines and contours. This was an inner experience that reproduced an experience of the imagination. 
At the same time, the experience represented an objective reproduction of external nature. It was an experience of the dreamlike imagination. People yielded to the images that worked internally in their organisms and through the organs of speech dressed the images in words. This is the only way we can imagine the inner process of the language experience in the early stages of human development. If we experience with this observation and take it further, using, for example, the experience of the sound that we call M today, we realize that in an earlier time, the sound was at the borderline between consonant and vowel. The pronunciation of the word manas could be compared to the way we would paint a picture today without applying surface colors that would highlight the outer border lines of the inner distinctions. On the other hand, when the sound ah was pronounced, people felt something like the inner world of the human being. And if I want to describe the entire word manas in this way, then I would have to say that in those ancient times, language gave life to people's dreamlike images as our consciousness today gives life to language. As for language now, we do not live in dreamlike imaginations any longer. Our consciousness goes beyond the use of language. But for Sanskrit speakers in the past, the old dreamlike images kept flowing into language. Those who pronounced the word manas felt as if they were in a shell. They felt as if the physical body, consisting of water and other liquids, was some kind of a shell and as if the other body was carried by a vessel of air. When people of ancient times pronounced the word manas, they experienced all this as in a dream. In their souls they did not feel the same way as we do today. They felt themselves to be vessels of the soul life. The soul was experienced as something given by the supra-terrestrial and supra-human forces of the shell. If we want to grasp the old content of a word, we should first awaken this experience. We should also know that today when we feel the self, our inner psychic experience is very different from the experience that people in earlier times had when they said the word ego or from what people in earlier times experienced when they pronounced the Sanskrit word aham. Today we experience the self as something that has shrunk to a, into a single point, a point that we regard as the center of our inner being and all of our soul forces. This feeling was not the basis of the concept of the self revealed to the people of ancient times. In those ancient days the self was still felt as something that we carried, not as something that we were inside of. In a way, The self was perceived as something independent that swims on the waves of the psychic life. However, nothing in the composition of sounds suggested such perception. Thus, the content of the Sanskrit word aham is something surrounding the self or something that carries the self. In our time, we experience the self as an inner impulse of the will, which seems to penetrate our inner being as the center of a heat source irradiating heat rays in all possible directions, to use a comparison. In contrast to the ancient Greek and even to the Roman later, the self was something like a ball of water and this ball seemed to be completely filled with air. To state the analogy precisely, it is one thing to experience the air expanding in the ball of water and another to experience the internal radiation of a heat source that spreads warmth in all directions, but must be perceived as a ball filled with air. These, of course, are all symbols. However, the words in any given language are symbols too, and those who argue that words cannot be defined as symbols would not be able to participate in such observations. Therefore, if we want to discuss language, First, we should be able to understand the essence of the object of linguistics. Then we would realize that in ancient times the character of language was very different from the character language has in modern civilizations. We would also realize that in the past 
The physical bodily element played a more major role in the producing of sounds and in the configuring of words. People invested language with their inner life much more than they do now. This is why they had the M in the beginning of the word manas, because it included the idea of the human and gave it contours. When we look at Sanskrit expressions, we soon notice that they represent the experience of both consonantal and vocal elements. We notice that there is some inner immersion in the external processes and the physicality of the external world. We realize that the formation of words and the entire process of speech are the result of imitation in the consonants and the feelings of sympathy and antipathies in the vowels. There was a much more physical nuance to the way all this came to be in ancient times. An ancient language was experienced more fully. We still could have a similar experience today. If you listen to people who speak Sanskrit or any other language of the Eastern civilizations, you can hear how the sounds they produce reflect their entire being, including their physical bodies, and other speech as the characteristic of music. It comes from the same kind of an inner experience as music, only at a much later stage of human development was music separated from logic or from the soul that lived in simple images. We could notice this today too. If we compare the inner experience of the German language to that of English, we would realize that in English the process of living within the framework of abstract ideas is more advanced. If we want to live in the German language, we have to immerse ourselves in those forms that emerged with New High German. Dialects allow our psyche to dive into even more intense, more vigorous experience. The real spiritual experience of the German language becomes possible only at the stage of High German. This is why someone like Hegel was formed under such conditions. He was a person formed entirely by the belief that the idea is something independent, in itself. Yet it is experienced exclusively through a particular element of language. For that reason it is possible to translate Hegel into another of the Western languages, for in his works we still experience language in an immediate way. In the West you will notice everywhere in people's experience that the psyche unfolds when it is devoted to the use of language. The psyche is capable of intense experience, but everywhere language is being thrown out of the immediate experience of the psyche. In English, for example, the stream of speech flows and flows, and out of the flowing water people constantly build something like sheets of ice that swim on top of the waves as firm meanings. When we speak High German, we realize that in the stream of speech there is something liquid, and that, in contrast to English, in the stream no ice flows have formed to fall out of the language. This contrast is a phenomenon connected to the human soul and the human spirit. In the East you will find the same process at an even earlier stage of development. There you will not see ice flows being thrown out of the stream of language, Neither will you experience the complete overlap between thought and word, as in High German. Instead, you will find that the word is experienced in a way that keeps it in the organism, although the thought is something that escapes the word, something that we have to run after or that moves ahead of us. If we want to understand language, these are the things we need to become aware of. We cannot deal with them if we do not accept, at least to a certain degree, Goethe's phenomenological approach to observation, which he established in relation which he established in, in relation to the living world of plants. When we follow it consistently in our inner experience and in our inner practice, such an approach leads to the development of imaginative abilities mentioned in anthroposophy. Those who want to analyze language should generally approach it in a way that allows them to experience the inner metamorphosis of its organization in a concrete way. 
Only then can we see the real language process. As long as we are not able to lift ourselves to the level of such language analysis, we will be looking at language only from an external point of view, and we will not be able to make any progress to the discovery of its real object. This is why in our present culture there are so many different theories of language. Thinking about language has become, in many respects, thinking about the origins of language. And there are a number of theories established with regard to this question. Wilhelm Bund lists them in his title Theory of Language and takes them apart in his criticism. We see the same happening in many other areas. And we saw the same thing here yesterday as well. When the supporters of a particular school of thought in modern science begin to contemplate and analyze the facts offered by the science they represent, they begin to speak of a, in quotes, downfall. This is certainly not what anthroposophy wants to tell you. Yesterday, for example, almost nothing was mentioned about a downfall from the perspective of anthroposophy. Those who discussed theology, however, spoke a good deal about a downfall. When people philosophize about language, we also hear of the downfall of theories, such as the theory of invention. Wundt lists and discusses various theories. According to the theory of invention, language was established or invented as people gave things certain definitions. Today, according to Wundt, this explanation no longer sounds plausible. How would deaf-mute people have determined forms of language even very primitive forms. As second choice, Wundt mentions the miracle theory. According to this theory, at a particular stage of human development, the Creator gave language to the human being as a gift. As Dr. Geyer mentioned yesterday, no scientist, the least bit respectable, is allowed to believe in miracles today. This is forbidden, thus the miracle theory is no longer acceptable. Next on this list is the theory of imitation, which contains some plausible elements, since it says that the consonant element of language is based on a process that is much more internal than the one we usually imagine. Next, Wundt mentions the theory of natural sounds. This theory implies that what humans attempted to find in language on the basis of their inner experience was the overlap between the sound of the words and the perceptions of external nature, accompanied by sympathies and antipathies. All these theories could be formulated in a different way, too. Currently, simply on the grounds proposed by those who have criticized those theories, it is possible to show that none of them can grasp the real object of language. As a matter of fact, although people say that they do not need to turn to anthroposophy, It can demonstrate that it offers certain productive thoughts that could help science find the purest, most clear objects of observation, even in an area such as the theory of language. We can certainly discuss many things, including language, even if we do not yet see language as a pure object of contemplation. Anthroposophy, however, has a profoundly scientific character and it aims, first of all, at the clarification of the question, what kind of reality can we find in a particular scientific field to experience within ourselves the connection between the things we perceive as truth or knowledge in a field and a specific kind of reality. Some people say about our work, which is not any easier than the work in any other branch of science, that anthroposophy, quote, sticks its nose in everything, close quote, as was mentioned here yesterday. We will have to give the following response. It certainly turned out that in the process of its development, anthroposophy had to stick its nose in everything. But if we do not want this superficial perception, that anthroposophy sticks its nose in everything, to leave a permanent mark, rather, we should move on and pay attention to and study the questions that arise when anthroposophy investigates things seriously. Then and only then, when we come to this second stage of our relationship to anthroposophy, will we be able to fertilize, excuse me, will we be able to realize how fertile anthroposophy is and to what extent it is vindicated 
when confronted with the kind of judgment just mentioned, which appears to be only a superficial observation. That is the end of lecture seven, the end of the seven lectures, and the next thing after this will be a, a report that was given by Steiner later on. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, we have two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in London that are the sole translators of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies. It is the, I've read the seven lectures, this is the eighth part of this, which is a report that Steiner gave, read in Dornach on March 18th. It is translated, this set has been translated by Judith Wormuth Atkinson, and it is collected works volume 81. Report on the Anthroposophy course at the University of Berlin. Excerpts from the talk given to members in Dornach, March 18, 1922. My dear friends, allow me to say a few words about the way the college course in Berlin went. The program of the course in Berlin was organized in a very special way. The goal was to present the relationship that different scientific fields and different areas of life have to the anthroposophic view of the world. Each single day was dedicated primarily to a particular scientific field or area of life. The week was organized in such a way that we began on Sunday with a topic dedicated to the branch of natural science dealing with inorganic matter. The following Monday was dedicated to the sciences dealing with organic matter and to medicine. Tuesday to philosophy. Wednesday to education, Thursday to political economy, and Friday to theology. Saturday was supposed to be dedicated to linguistics, and we were supposed to round up the whole course on the second Sunday with a Eurythmy presentation in the Deutsches Theater. The program was designed so that each day began with a short lecture given by myself. Only the first Sunday could not begin in this way, because I was not able to be in Berlin on that day. Thus, in my introductory words on Monday, I offered a summary of the sciences dealing with both organic and inorganic matter. The rest of the day maintained the usual character. After my introductory words, in the morning, there were two more lectures, and after that we had a half-hour snack break. But, as you have already heard, there were no snacks offered in the rooms of the Vocal Academy, Then from one to two we had a discussion, followed from two to three by the last lecture scheduled for the morning. It was an exhausting program. In the evening there were lectures held partly by myself in the Philharmonic Hall and partly by others in the rooms of the University of Berlin. There was one lecture every evening, and after each lecture, with the exception of mine, there was some time left for people to express themselves on the topic. As you see, all these days were extremely busy. The structure of the program was very interesting, particularly because of the formulations given to the separate daily programs. To a degree, each day had a general title, and the formulations of these general titles were particularly interesting because they implied some very significant issues. With the exception of Friday, the the day dedicated to theology, there was something very positive in the formulation of the title for each day. This already is something important, not so much because it spoke of the spirit of the time, but because it showed the attitude toward anthroposophy of those who created the program. Those who created the other programs felt some pressure to formulate their daily schedules in a positive-sounding way. We could see the importance only by looking at these formulations. Sunday, March 5th, titled, From a Mechanical Approach Hostile to Life, to true phenomenology. In the title of this program we see the expression of hope that through anthroposophy we will find a kind of phenomenology that will represent the foundation of natural science. 
including its branches dealing with inorganic matter. The morning for Monday was summarized in an even more positive way. Title Ways of Achieving Anthroposophic Knowledge of the Human Being in Biology and Medicine. The same could be said about the Tuesday program for philosophy titled Justification of Anthroposophy on the Basis of the Contemporary Philosophical Consciousness. Similarly, positive was the program for Wednesday titled From the Modern Pedagogical Requirements to Their Realization Through Anthroposophy. This title also demonstrates the idea that today there are pedagogical requirements that could be fulfilled through anthroposophy. The formulation of the general title for Thursday, the day dedicated to social sciences, was even more auspicious, though the lectures held on that day were not so promising. The title, however, was extremely hopeful and sounded very positive. Title, Prospects for the National Economy. The title for Sunday, the day dedicated to linguistics, was title, From a Dead to a Living Theory of Language. You can see that all these formulations have as a common basis the intention to show us the ways from our contemporary times into establishing the respective spiritual paths with the help of anthroposophy. We now have some idea of how different disciplines begin with the existing contemporary scientific formulations but move toward other ways of cognition which could be offered by anthroposophy. In other words, all the sciences have very concrete ideas of alternative approaches. However, on Thursday, as I said, we had a particularly auspicious title, Prospects for the National Economy, an abstract formulation that precisely in its abstractness points out that we should not walk, but we should leap, if I may put it this way. If you look now at the general formulation of the title for Friday, you will read title the downfall of religion in contemporary theology and its redefinition in anthroposophy. At first, the formulation here appears to be very negative. The downfall of religion in contemporary theology and its redefinition in anthroposophy. This title points out in a very negative way that there is something like anthroposophy through which theology and religion could be renewed. However, the title does not explain in any concrete way how we are going to get from the mess in which we are today to an anthroposophic attitude. If you compare this to the formulation of the Sunday topic, titled From a Mechanical Approach Hostile to Life to True Phenomenology, already can be seen in the word phenomenology a very concrete definition of what is supposed to come. The phrase knowledge of the human in the title on Monday, also emphasizes something very concrete. The day about philosophy emphasized the philosophical consciousness of our time, another very concrete point. The day on education focused on the requirements of modern times, and the title on the day of linguistics says, title from a dead to a living theory of language, a formulation that also leads to very concrete ideas. It is really telling that this college course, which from both an inner and an outer perspective, culminated with the performance on Friday and which had basically a theological character, or at least it felt that way, it is, the telling, it is telling that this college course, which was very well attended anyway, attracted such a number of people on Friday, on the day of theology, that the room was filled with people to the point of overflowing. It is also telling that precisely the formulation of theology as a topic of the day was the only one in this college course to sound negative. These formulations were certainly based on the existing circumstances, and people tried to formulate the topics in a very honest and direct way, on one hand as a reflection of modern consciousness, and on the other as a reflection of the idea of a transformation of this consciousness through anthroposophy. If we look now at the individual days, we would certainly see things that we are familiar with to some degree. From a mechanical approach hostile to life to true phenomenology, this is also about making a point that we should overcome all speculations about atomism and about a mechanical conception of inorganic nature. 
It discusses how we could achieve pure observation of the essence of phenomena, how these phenomena could speak for themselves, and how they could offer their own theories. The idea that we should practice Gertianism with regard to natural science was clearly expressed in this formulation. In addition, the formulation about the scientific branches dealing with organic nature expresses the fact that we should build our entire scientific conception of organic nature on the basis of our knowledge of the human being. In other words, this title tells us that we must not look at the different kingdoms of nature as if they were broken pieces, as we do today. Rather, we should give priority to the study of the human being and we should explore the rest of the kingdoms of nature on the basis of that knowledge. Regarding philosophy, the lectures on Tuesday demonstrated that philosophical thought has come to a dead end of sorts. It is interesting to consider this formulation in the context of Hegel, for example. Already in the beginning of the 19th century, Hegel said in his philosophy that all contemporary philosophy is at some kind of an end, and that generally we only could look back at the course of the historical development of philosophy, but that no further development is possible. On that day, Tuesday, a suggestion was made that the end of philosophy could be turned into a beginning, a new beginning, if that beginning is formed in the framework of anthroposophy. The lecture on education emphasized that everyone who is really thinking has some requirements with regard to pedagogy, but that these requirements cannot be fulfilled using the methods that contemporary pedagogy is developing. In other words, the requirements that generally all thinking people have with regard to pedagogy could be fulfilled only with the help of anthroposophy. The lecture on theory of language demonstrated that language itself should not be perceived as something found in dead documents, as the case is in contemporary linguistics, but that it has to be perceived as a living organism and in relation to the human being. About social science, I can say only that Emil Leinhaus made very important points about today's financial problem in a very competent and very positive way. However, as you yourselves must feel sometimes, we cannot say very many positive things about today's financial problem. You can feel this even here in Switzerland, the country with almost the highest currency value. But you can certainly believe that we cannot say many positive things about today's financial problem if we cross the border. In brief, we cannot say many positive things at all. The following two lectures did not mention anything positive and this day dedicated to the national economy showed that the way we treat the national economy within our anthroposophic movement has failed over and over. Despite the fact that precisely with regard to this area we have repeatedly emphasized the necessity for those who have insight into our economic life to come up with something more certain about the future of political economy. Basically, we have not been able to offer any ideas that could satisfy the requirements of our present time. In this sense, the title of that day, Prospects for the National Economy, represented an attempt to dance with a promise. What the day actually brought about, however, was more or less a crippled partner limping after the dancer. Regarding theology, I should say that the titles of the three lectures following my introductory discourse, were as interesting as the formulation of the program for this day. The title of the first lecture by Licentiant Bach was uh, titled The Fall of Religion into Psychologism. The title of Dr. Riddlemeyer's lecture was The Fall of Theology into Irrationalism. And the third lecture given by Dr. Geyer was entitled The Fall of Theology into Historicism. So, in these few days we heard three different descriptions of the downfall of theology or religion. In a way, the situation today resulted naturally in the fact that it was theologians who, on the basis of their very specific experience in thinking and feeling, described how they have come to a dead end in theology. If we remember then the positive things we heard on that day, we could summarize the lectures on that day in the following way. 
The way theology looks at religion, according to licentiate Bach, leads to seeing only the experience of the soul, defined as religious experience or as an experience of God. We find that among other experiences of the soul, the human being has also some religious experience or some kind of an experience that somehow points at the divine. However, if we are unbiased toward this experience, we could say, yes, this is simply a subjective experience, a purely psychological experience. We cannot find any proof that there is anything in the objective world that corresponds to this experience. In modern theology, the subjective experience of God does not lead to the real acceptance of God, and certainly not to a particular view of the nature of the divine in the world. To a certain degree, the religious element in human consciousness is suffocated by the psychological fact that, yes, we need some religious life, but there is nothing that can give us an assurance that this need could be satisfied. The psychological fact that the human being needs religion is given, but our times do not know how to give religion some content. This was approximately the conclusion in the first lecture by Licentiate Bach. After that, Dr. Rittelmeyer explained why theology had enough of rationalism and how it had come to the point when it did not any longer want to be defining the essence of God in the world of thought, when it did not want any longer to say that this or that is the content of the divine that penetrates the entire existence of the world. Thought had to be excluded from theology. Rationality and everything else based on reason had to be taken out. Instead, the irrational, everything that excludes intellectual thought, is supposed to become the content of theology. In other words, theology is supposed to deal exclusively with the most superficial abstractions. We do not dare say that God's being could be grasped through thought. We dare say only that God's being is the unconditional, the absolute. Thus we construct a completely abstract concept the irrational, something that cannot be grasped by reason. Is it not true that in any other area it would seem very strange to characterize things in such negative terms? Imagine, for example, that someone asks who the head of the Gertianum is, and the answer is, someone who is not head of any other institution. In this case, we will have no information about who really is the head of the Gertianum, Similarly, we cannot get any idea about the divine when we say that the rational, excuse me, that the rationale of the divine being consists of the fact that God is something irrational that cannot be grasped by reason. All of this is only negating. Riddlemeyer established a connection between these explanations and what contemporary irrationalists have to say. For example, what the inner behavior of people is who are trying to elevate themselves to this God who could be understood only in an irrational way. What is one's experience of such an attempt? It is a silent experience. However, this is not the silence in a mystical experience, which could be very positive. This is rather the point of not saying anything, of ceasing to speak in thoughts, even to oneself. We heard further how this silence grows roots into the ritual. In fact, the reason to seek refuge in silence is the absolute inability to formulate just about anything. Later it was interesting to hear two gentlemen, a professor and a priest, who were defending this irrationalism and were trying to prove particularly that irrationalism is predominant in our time. The professor, for example, said, yes, this is right, it would be silly to say that God could be figured out only in the spirit, but not in nature. Nature is not further away from God than the spirit. He also said that with regard to God, the knowledge of the spirit does not offer more than the knowledge of nature, for God is the unconditional that penetrates everything. He was repeating this statement frequently, namely that God is the unconditional that penetrates everything. Theology, Faust would use here the word, alas, not once but three times, Faust's lines, philosophy and jurisprudence, medicine and even alas, 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 theology, 
should be rewritten if we get to hear such statements all the time. God is the unconditional that penetrates everything. We imagine what is called everything and then something appears, something surfaces, but this something is actually the undefined. The last lecture was given by Dr. Geyer. He was talking about the downfall of theology into historicism. Geyer was trying to demonstrate how theology has gradually reached the point when it cannot come up with any creative ideas on its own, when it can only observe what has already passed. In other words, in order to discover some content, it emphasizes the constant study of history or of what has already passed. Naturally, this approach leads us, in the best case, to the possibility of saying, in the past, people had religious consciousness, but today they are only able to analyze the different stages of past religious consciousness and to choose something that they still would like to preserve. Unfortunately, when they try to choose, they find that there is nothing left of what the different epochs in the past offered them. I myself introduced this program with a remark that anthroposophy certainly does not try to found a religion, but wants to achieve the cognition of the supersensory world instead. Thus, if theology wants to be inspired by it, this will be very welcome. Anthroposophy will say what it has to say about the supersensory world, and in its own turn, it will wait to see what use it could make of theology. Those who have a sense for the complex situation of our times noticed a deficiency, particularly on that day, which, however, resulted from the circumstances. If we were supposed to exhaust the topic of the day completely, as we tried to do, and that we achieved to a certain degree with the rest of the daily topics, with the exception of the topic on social science, then we should have had a Catholic theologian speak as well. All of the lectures that were held on that day were grounded in Protestant consciousness. A Catholic theologian would have been in a completely different position than the three Protestant speakers. A Catholic theologian is well served, not only by a theology that is historically inherited, but by a theology that is historically inherited and eternally valid, a theology that is supposed to be as alive today as it was in the 3rd or the 2nd century A.D., The Church Councils and the institution of the Pope, which became infallible in the 19th century, have added something to that theology. However, this was only about particular dogmas, about additions. The essence of Catholic theology is in fact something that firstly does not depend on the developments in different times, and that secondly should have a perennial or everlasting character. If a more progressive Catholic had spoken about Catholic theology, he probably would have been in a very interesting opposition to the struggle of a Catholic thinker such as Cardinal Neumann. If a less progressive Catholic theologian had spoken, he would have presented the essence of the everlasting doctrine of salvation or a Catholic theology. Then people would have had questions of great importance, as for example the question, what does Catholic theology bring to people of today? There is no doubt that in its present state, Catholic theology cannot offer any living ideas to modern consciousness. Its content is rooted exclusively in the experience of old spiritual, if even atavistic, knowledge. The concepts of which Catholic theology consists, such as the creation or redemption, or the essence of the Trinity, all those concepts have some essence, but their essence cannot be comprehended any longer by the modern consciousness. Instead, they are transformed into abstract, incomprehensible dogmatism, unless they are not even transformed, but are simply accepted as incomprehensible, dry dogmatism. Especially in the 19th century, Catholic theology developed in a way that made it impossible to recognize what the contents of the different dogmas contained. During the college course in Berlin, We had an interesting experience related to this. In my introductory remarks on Friday, I said something that was based on my immediate experience and which I had already mentioned to you. I said, unless they are crippled, those who can experience our immediate natural environment 
and everything related to it, will come to the consciousness of God the Father. If during the course of their lives some of them find the experience of God the Father unsatisfactory and come to some kind of an inner rebirth, they will experience God the Son or the Son of God. In the very same way, if we continue taking further steps, we will come to the experience of the Holy Ghost. To this a Protestant professor, Licentian Tillich, made a remark, Aha! Here is the Trinity that has to be constructed, and he called the fact a construction. He did not notice at all that at the basis of all this is experience. This was alien to him. The experiences that were at the basis of the Catholic dogmas were also alien to the modern consciousness of the 19th century. Originally, the Catholic dogmas were certainly based on spiritual reality too, but today we do not understand this reality any longer. We deal simply with empty concepts. In the 19th century, Catholic theology had to revive its content at least a little bit, even if only superficially. You may well know that the desire to be able to understand again at least a little bit appeared particularly strong under the pontificate of Leo XIII. This is why we had the Catholic ordinance, or shall I say the ordinance of Rome, for all Catholic theologians to go back to the study of the Thomistic philosophy, the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, since the entire philosophy after him was no longer useful for the understanding of the Catholic dogmas. In order to give natural science its foundations, the philosophy following that of Thomas Aquinas can help us only to understand the existence of nature. It cannot help us understand spiritual facts, which Catholics do not understand well either, but which were formulated in the Catholic dogmas at a time when people still knew something about those facts. The entire later post-Thomistic philosophy is useless in the attempt to understand these spiritual facts. When people felt again the desire to understand some of the Catholic dogmas, Rome requested the renewed study of Thomistic philosophy, the real endeavor of Roman Catholicism regarding philosophy until today. There are certainly historical reasons for that. However, if we draw a comparison to the needs we have today in order to come back to spirituality, we will see that Thomism is not enough to revive the old rigid Roman dogmas we have to come to a completely different observation. Please remember my view that Hamlet is a student of Faust, regardless of time and space, a view I presented to you in my last few lectures before I left Dornach, and which a contemporary literary historian would find completely perverse. I said that Hamlet must have been sitting at Faust's feet for ten years, for the same ten years when Faust was leading his students by the nose, and that Hamlet must have been one of those students who was led by the nose in all possible directions. Such connections are appalling to any contemporary literary historian, but today we cannot say anything significant about the spiritual that will not be appalling for the official representatives of the sciences. Today the stigma of the real truth is exactly what appalls the public representatives of the sciences. So if you take this interpretation for something profane, you will see that we need to achieve a certain mobility of the spirit, a mobility that could offer a foundation for the understanding of the essence preserved in the dogmas. You will realize that we have to go back to a completely different state of the psyche in order to learn the art of living within such dogmas, and this shows precisely the process of the development of Cardinal Neumann. In Berlin today, it may be very normal to speak in a college course like this, like this only from the perspective of Protestantism and to ignore the Catholic standpoint. However, we are not going to get the picture of what is really predominant today if we are not capable of discussing the Catholic perspective in some way. Exactly in our time, when we need to look at the entire world as a whole, this is impossible. Today, you see, we have overcome the speaking of church tower science, of church tower worldviews alone. You already 
know the church tower politics, but there is also such a thing as church tower worldviews. We are confronted with it in a powerful way, especially when we experience something like Dr. Teberath's lecture on Friday, for example, when he spoke on the topic atomistic and realistic approaches to chemical processes. Dr. Terabat, excuse me, Dr. Teberath, who is employed in our research institute in Stuttgart, tried to show that atomism has to be abandoned and that phenomenology should be introduced into chemistry. Dr. Kurt Greiling entered the debate too. At this point, I do not wish to talk about Dr. Kurt Greiling's Greiling, who carried on with approximately the following prescription. Yes, the anthroposophists talk about just about everything, but none of it seems to me very likely. What is certain is that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we should stick to what is cert- certain. 2 plus 2 equals 4. This is certain. Close quote. He asserted this opinion already last summer in the course in Stuttgart, and on one particular evening, He even brought two more university professors to support his assertion that 2 plus 2 equals 4. One could not argue with him. By mentioning this, I would like only to suggest symbolically what he said, namely that 2 plus 2 is really 4. I could not argue against it. I could not argue even last Friday when he said completely out of context that in Stuttgart I admitted that 2 plus 2 equals 4. I certainly cannot deny that. I don't mean now literally 2 plus 2 equals 4. I am talking about things that he discussed back then and which are equally valuable in the broader context. Then he said, Yes, regarding the question raised here, the question of phenomenology, we should say that we cannot make judgments about it from the point of view of natural science. We have to judge it from the point of view of philosophy. I do not wish to say that this is a typical attitude for Göttingen, but this statement was at least not very sophisticated or scientific. In England, for example, no one would understand a statement that says that we cannot judge something from the point of view of science, but only from the point of view of philosophy, because this is precisely what a church tower worldview is. Only particular central European circles would know what this statement means. In any event, when we speak of questions like that today, we need a much wider horizon. For example, we cannot possibly keep talking about East, West and the center between them. The formulations in the program for the Congress in Vienna repeat constantly the words East, West and Central, and I do not object. I think that talking about East, West and Central is in the spirit of great ideas but I believe that our concepts should be a bit broader and that they should really cover those regions. We surely cannot embrace the entire world by looking at it from a narrow-minded perspective. Thus, in the lectures on religion and theology in Berlin, there was something missing, for example, with regard to the Western development of religious life, because Catholicism was completely ignored even though there is nothing tangible in the Western religious life, if we look at it only from the Protestant perspective. We did not even touch upon the question of the development of English Puritanism or the High Church. I do not mean to criticize all this, since the points that we did discuss were excellent. However, in our close anthroposophic circle, I would like to talk about the issues that should have been mentioned in relation to the discussed processes. In such relation it should have been demonstrated how our contemporary way of thinking is not capable at all of even approaching the old sources of theological content. In Berlin we did not see any bridge between modern evangelical theology and the ideas that anthroposophy should offer to revive religious consciousness. There were only references to the fact that these ideas should come from anthroposophy, but basically nothing was said about the way all this should materialize. This will probably give you an idea of the struggle in the arena of anthroposophy that recently found its most beautiful expression in Berlin. The lectures, even the morning lectures, 
attracted a very large audience, and thus the participation of various different circles showed that there is some life in the anthroposophic movement, a life that appeals strongly and with great intensity to contemporary human consciousness. At the same time, we did not spare sharp phrases that could characterize the truth. It gives me some inner joy to remember that on Sunday evening, Dr. Schubert tried to show within the framework of the topic Anthroposophy and Theory of Language that language plays a role in the political life of peoples and races, and that during the debate he passionately explained what language theory is today and what it should become with the help of anthroposophy. He was very passionate when he said that, yes, he had been in Berlin, that he has studied linguistics with various professors, and then he turned to to anthroposophy to give life to the linguistics he had studied. Only then did he have a revelation and he understood what contemporary linguistics really is, a piece of garbage. And then he slammed the table with his fist. So he was very generous with the phrases characterizing our time. The opponents were not much better. I cannot avoid saying that they were passionate, so I would rather not say anything. During the evening panels, some people tried to offer some idea of what the content of anthroposophy is. It was very important that both Dr. Stein and Dr. Schwebsch showed vivid images illustrating the pedagogical effect achieved in the Waldorf School. What I want to say is that we could experience some remarkable moments just reading between the lines. The course closed on Sunday. I gave the closing lecture on the last evening, and the morning panels ended with an extremely successful performance of Eurythmy in the Deutsches Theater which was filled to the last seat. I do not need to say that if you get hold of any newspaper, you will read the opposite of what really happened in Berlin. However, there is a gentleman who had written an article in one of the Berlin newspapers, and his article was considered to be pro-anthroposophy. I do not wish to express an opinion about this. The same person then asked another big newspaper whether he could write an article about the college course in Berlin, They asked him pro or against. He answered pro because he thought that his article would be pro-anthroposophy. Then the newspaper people said, no, we take only articles against it. This means that no one cares what people write about anthroposophy. Rather, they buy only articles against it. Consequently, if you read any outsider's reports, you will not get any idea of what really happened in Berlin. It is a pity that except for the performance in the Deutsches Theater and the short performances on Thursday and Sunday, there were no more Eurythmy performances. Because following the example of the Anthroposophic Congress in Stuttgart, they could have helped the overwhelmed participants to take the burden of those fully occupied days somewhat better. I can imagine that it was very hard. Think, for example, of any one of those days, say an average day, when we did not have additional meetings for more people. On such a day, someone who participated in all the panels would have heard five lectures and one discussion. It is too much for people today to listen to five lectures and one discussion. In fact, on a normal day, there were two discussions. This means that we had the opportunity to live continually with such thoughts from nine to three and then again from eight until half past ten in the evening. It would have been certainly much better if there had been some short Eurythmy performances in between, just for a change, as they did in Stuttgart. Overall, however, the result was significant. That is the end of the report, or Part 8, of uh, Reimagining Academic Studies in Science, Philosophy, Theology, Education, Social Science, Theory of Language by Rudolf Steiner, and the end of the book.